Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to talk about growth. A lot of us start off as freelancers and eventually we start hiring a couple of people. And before you know it, you've hired a lot of people. And how do you manage that? So we'll talk a little bit about that in the second hour. Uh, a quick reminder, of course, that you can ask questions throughout the first hour. If you're in Makana, you can just ask the questions there. You can chat with others and you can vote. Um, your votes matter. We're getting more and more questions in. So it really does matter that you vote on those questions, excuse me, vote on those questions to uh, make sure that we know what order you'd like us to talk. We tend to run on a little bit more at the top of the hour than the bottom of the hour. <laughs> so um, so go ahead and uh, vote on those questions and move them up. Uh, if you're not in Makana, of course, you can ask the question at askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global. So you can throw those questions in 24-7. So I got up this morning, I looked at some of the questions and brought those in because they were at askofficehours.global. Of course, just anytime you think of a question, you can throw them in there. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Jason, what do we have? Kane Treble in Madura, Australia writes in, I recently mapped the undocumented functions of my Roadcaster 2 to further automate live streams. What geeky small victories have you left smiling for days, have left you smiling for days that the rest of the world might appreciate? Small geeky victories. Um, I think that my, my, my most recent one is not really that much of a geeky one. It was just that I that I had this beep. I could not find. We talked about this over the weekend. I couldn't find a KVM that was up to eight uh, that was relatively inexpensive, and I finally found one. But then it beeped all the time, and I realized that's probably just a PZO. And so I just took it apart and uh, tore it out, put it back in, <laughs> and my life has been much better since. Uh, didn't because you just couldn't use it during a show uh, because of that. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, there's a couple recently. Uh, I've had a Stream Deck XL for a while now. I'm planning on adding another one, but I've just been really enjoying streamlining my workflow. Uh, I've got a page here uh, that accesses the functions on my digital mixer and just being able to have separate volume control for the playback on my main Mac computer, which has comms on it, and a separate volume for the feed that uh, that returns from Zoom is really, really nice. Plus ha being able to control the mutes for all the microphones that I use. So just having that at arm's length has been really, really awesome. And also recently finding new NVMe enclosures that have better cooling that uh, don't allow the storage drive to completely disintegrate. That's been great. Go, Bill. What threw me off is the word small, because the one that comes to my mind most is not small at all. It was huge, and it was back when Final Cut X first came out. I was having, I was just exploring. I had no idea what was going on with it, and I got a chance to sit down at a lunch, and sitting next to me was Phil Hodgetts, who's one of the guys at Intelligent Assistance, and he took about 10 minutes to explain to me the power of metadata and how it was going to change everything. Those were probably the next that 10 minutes and the day or two after that, wrapping my head around the potential impact of understanding metadata, that, that data that lives in a sidecar of files, literally has changed everything I've done since then. It's helped me understand more about editing, more about just my general life, because it kind of controls everything out there. So um, that wasn't small. That was huge for me. Go to Jane. Two quick things. Number one, I love it when it just works. I plugged in my, uh, I, the other day I was trying to shade my camera and I plugged in the DaVinci micro panel that I use for Resolve into the Mac over USB. And with no setup at all, I started turning knobs in my image on the, on the Blackmagic 6K via the ATEM. Started going up and down. That was awesome. Uh, also, Mickey told me yesterday I can plug the Korg Nano Controller into the Mix Pre and now I have an actual fader instead of having to use the radial dial and a mute button there, which is super nice. Number two, my party trick is being able to find a photo really quickly. And I just, I, I love the places albums on the, where you can just see where you took the photo. And the fact that the iPhone, or and I think Android does this too, you can just type, if you want to find a picture of your dog, type in dog. Every picture you ever took of a dog comes up. And it's one of those just, man, when it just works, it's amazing. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. 
Uh, yeah, it's not, I don't know if it's, you'd call it a small victory, but discovering 3D printing where, you know, I didn't buy a 3D printer for the longest time because you'd see all these people online, <clears throat> oh, I got this 3D printer to print my little my little Dungeons and Dragons uh, place, you know, and so I didn't play. Hey, hey you shading us, the, those of us who play Dungeons and Dragons, that's, that's what I want. <laughs> but for printing your little pieces to, you know, I went, well, I don't play Dungeons and Dragons. There's no need for me to get a 3D printer. But then I realized, hey, you know, I can print practical stuff like VESA mounts and a, a vertical holder for the Melee Quieter 3 in just a few minutes with Tinkercad. And it's like, uh, it's now it's the universal solution to any mechanical problem that I have. Yeah, I I, I do I do admit that the th using the 3D printer always feels... I don't know. There's something about it that when I'm building things, because usually I'm not building anything interesting. It's like I need some little piece that just kind of puts this over here or stacks this up over there. And it's, uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty, it's, it's an amazing little device. Go ahead, uh, Mitchell. I'm always in search of the best muting switch. I've got my big uh, studio technologies here, <clears throat> which I love. But because I'm sending my audio through my camera and then into the ATEM, there happens to be an on-off button on the ATEM that glows brightly red. Uh, that you could turn on and off just by touching the buttons on it. So there's a quick way to do it, but I'm still going to stay with my studio technology. It's funny. I, I never thought of that. <laughs> I was just running it through the That's camera. That's why it's a smiler. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, next, one of those buttons that I never use. Next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana, writes in, what's the best app for Android filming? I go ahead, Courtney. I have a Samsung phone, and I just use the built-in app for, uh, you know, shooting video. But, you know, the Samsung phones that I have have built-in uh, micro SD cards, so I can put a 450-gigabyte uh, uh, micro SD card there and record to it. So that solves a lot of the problems that you would have for having to go out an outside recorder of some sort. So that's what I use. Next question. Payne Treble in Madura, Australia writes in, any recommendations for ways to easily log timestamps for editing when recording a live stream, preferably something that could be used with BitFocus Companion? Good, Bill. The one that I had the most uh, success with uh, was from Intelligent Assistance. It was called uh, Lumberjack, and they put together it, it, like five or six, maybe seven years ago, this incredible system where in any live interview situation, you would pre-build on your phone a list of topics you thought would come up during the interview or a list of people who might be interviewed. And then as they talk, you, uh, an assistant can literally sit there and tap those, and it takes that note in real time, puts it into an XML list, and then you can bring it into your NLE and you will have all of those little clips, all the people, all the topics and everything pre-built into your Final Cut system. That's what I was using it with. It was amazing. I haven't seen a lot of things like it since then, but it is quite possible to do kind of like pre-editing with a system like that. Brilliant thing. So take a look at that if, if that's the system you're in. Go ahead, Courtney. Can't hear you. Find my mouse again. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, I wrote something for doing this with audio files <clears throat> years ago. And if you have uh, Windows, it's still available called BWF Widget. And what it does is it reads all the audio files, pulls all the uh, metadata out, and puts it into a grid, which you can then save as a uh, as a database file. So you can sort things based on time code in, time code out, duration, scene, and take number. So it pulls all the database information that is stored inside the broadcast wave files if you have professional broadcast wave files and are using the metadata. So you can sort everything by then. It would also generate uh, um, avid uh, uh, play, uh, avid playlist for doing back in the days when they were transferring transferring audio to video, but not much anymore. But it doesn't necessarily work with uh, doesn't work with video files, only broadcast wave files. Go ahead, Mitchell. Would that be uh, cart chunks, Courtney? Cart chunks? Yeah, cart chunks on the broadcast wave file. I'm just curious where the metadata gets. The media is in, in the best bext uh, in the bext chunk and in the uh, IXML chunk. So those are two chunks that are in there. And it also has a chunk viewer. You can look at the chunks in the broadcast wave file. And you can modify the time code, modify any of the uh, metadata in any of the files as well. And it'll batch process as well. So BWF widget. 
And on the iPad, I use a program called Timecode Logs, and it's really simple. I can't remember whether it cost anything or not. If it, if it did, it was a couple dollars. And it, you just open it up, and you literally start top. When you start, the, the key that, that I had to use was I'm in a live show, so I don't have a file to work with, and I want to type a note, and I just wanted to catch the time code as I start typing. So I don't have to sit there and hit time code or whatever. As I start typing what the note is, it just sits there and drops the time code in. And then it has, it just gives me a text file that has time code. It doesn't come back into Final Cut. doesn't do anything else. It doesn't do any, you know, like I didn't, I haven't tried anyway. It might, it might do that. I don't know. But what I do is I'm listening to the show going, oh, there was a cough there. Or, oh, I made a note, you know, that, that there was some, a pop or something like that. And it just lays out that time code. It's really easy because we start our shows at the top of the hour. Um, almost, I mean, often to the atomic time, uh, it's really easy for me to line those back up again. <laughs> so, so the, uh, so that's the, that's the one that I've used on the iPad. We had a really, we had a great interview with Jason Snell uh, on Friday with graymatter.show. And so Jason came on, he was talking and one of the things that he talked about in his podcast production was actually, he's connected it to his stream deck. And I don't know whether it's just stream deck or whether it is a uh, companion, but he has notes of specific things that he sees often, you know, that there was a cough or there was this needs to be edited out or this whatever. And he assigned those to to uh, buttons so that while he's in the podcast talking, he can just hit the button of this needs to be done and he knows where those buttons are. And it just, it, it takes the note and writes down the note for him in a, in a document um, as he's doing the podcast so that he can send that to his editor and, and have it done during the show. Um, but he's able to do it. He said, I don't have time to focus on that while I'm hosting the show. But while he's hosting the show, he's literally taking those notes. I'll try to find out more information about how he does that. But it, it was a <laughs> – from the there was a lot of great things about the podcast. It should come out tomorrow uh, or tonight. Um, but it that was one of the big oh, – <laughs> like that was that's a really smart thing to do. Uh, he's a smart guy. Now, next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana writes in, I haven't used it in a while, but opinions on backpackstudioapp.com are something else simple for beginning a pod, or for a beginning podcaster. I have a longtime radio friend who wants to make a podcast, but not a tech guy looking to steal him, right? Yeah, um, a couple things about that. One is uh, my temptation would be to... Um, Tr take a look at Squadcast. I mean, we did not have a su uh, super successful, but I was pushing it pretty hard. But, but just for audio, it may work well, and it works with Descript. It might be it's owned by Descript. It it might be something that that works a little bit more simply as far as being able to throw something together and have it help you with some of the edits and so on and so forth to get that done. Um, but I I don't know enough about uh, Backpack Studio. It also depends on what platform you're on. So you can also decide what you're going to record. Is he going to record both people locally or himself locally? Is it one person? Is it two people or people over Zoom? So there's a bunch of different things to do there. A lot of people like when they get started, um, like to use something like Reaper because it's not very expensive. I don't know if it costs anything. Anyway, but Reaper um, to uh, to be able to do their, their basic edits. It's a relatively, uh, Audacity is another one that is uh, inexpensive and they, they get started on it. The only thing I'll say is that if you're not technical and you're trying to do a podcast, you need to partner with someone that's technical. <laughs> like, you know, it is the, 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 the people will start doing, oh, like everyone wants to do a podcast. The problem is, is that they 90, I would say 95, somewhere between 95 and 99% of the podcasts are just horrible to listen to. And then they can't figure out why no one's listening to them. And, you know, and it's just, it's painful. It's like little needles in your ear um, of bad audio, um, echoey audio. And, and the thing is, if you're not technical, you're not paying attention to those things. And so um, it is a really, uh, it really makes a difference to have someone partnered, whether that's you, Chris, or whether he finds somebody else to do it. Um, yeah, Chris, Chris Fenwick is going to do it for you, I, I promise. Um, anyway, so, but the... Uh, you know, it, it it really makes a difference to find someone who's technical to do it. It could be a college student. It could be a family member. But just saying, people will say, just do it. I would not. I would not just do it. I would figure out how to do it well um, a little bit. Like, it doesn't have to be. You can have Audacity uh, audacity, or um, and a couple mics and, you know, two SM58s going into it with a little interface. That's not a big deal if you're having a couple people there. But really make sure that you understand enough about what you're doing or find someone to partner with. And it can be someone who's going to volunteer their time. They believe in the podcast. Maybe it's you. But non-technical people doing podcasts really, it just is, you know, there's a certain level of value of time. You know, And it doesn't mean you have to be an expert in audio, but I would not, 
if you're not technical at all, it's really, you're wasting your time, you're wasting other people's time, you're wasting a lot of time, you know, like, to, because it's just not going to, no one's going to listen to it. I don't know of any podcast you see in the top 100 that don't have pretty darn good audio at this point. Like, it, you could get away with that before, but if you're not putting out good audio, you should just give up. Like, you really need to, like, you know, it, it, it's, it's really not, people aren't listening to those podcasts. Um, yeah, go ahead, Bill. I'm just going to support what Alex has said. I, you know, I had a really uh, waking up moment. I used to do a lot of lecturing for Video Maker Magazine. I was on their staff, and I used to go around and talk to people. In almost every city that I went to, the most difficult questions for people to wrap their head around were audio-related, not video-related. We can all see the video, and we can kind of figure out, oh, the white balance is off or something. With audio, there's this disconnect and and people really don't understand how to listen. And you get very little feedback. Yes, you're hearing it, but figuring out, training your brain to figure out what is wrong with audio and particularly really good audio and learning the difference between, oh, that's clearly over compressed or there's splashy S's. People listen and they just go, well, I can hear what they're saying. And they stop there. And so what Alex is saying about paying attention to audio at a higher level really does make a huge difference. And I have never found that to be easy to find people who get that. When you find audio people who are great, they're very and, valuable in my opinion, and you should hold them dear. And I don't know if it has to be great, great. Like, I don't know if it has to be something that's going to win an award as far as audio. Well, you have but, to remove the problems, though. <clears throat> but when yeah, someone that, says it's non-technical, it, it, it worries me. It means that they're going to sit down at their dining room table with their computer and a couple, you know, or, and think that, you know, like, I don't know how untechnical they are. But but it's you really have they have to spend a li if they're committed to doing a podcast again my thing is is that there are if, you know lots of it, it's not expensive to put together a little kit that'll do a podcast but you do have to pay attention to it and you do have to pay attention to reflection quality of the audio etc. Next question. Samuel Nordvik in Norway writes in, Courtney, how do you compare the, your T9 Plus mini PC with the other mini PCs you've used in the past? How does, uh, does it have noticeable fan noise? With three HDMI outputs, it seems compelling, almost like a deal too good to be true compared to other mini PCs. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, well, there are a few with three outputs. The, this is the T9 that he's talking about here, and I'll hold it up next to the microphone. It's running at the moment. Oh, wait, let me turn off uh, original sound. But it's, uh, oh, <laughs> Chris is dying from the sound there. Uh, you no, know, you can just barely hear it. Uh, it has a, a very small, low, low uh, speed fan. And I guess if I were to really torture test it, it, the fan would come up a little bit. The quieter twos, which uh, have uh, two HDMI outputs, um, and they have one less... Uh, uh, Ethernet connection on them uh, are completely quiet. They're completely silent, and they have a 5105 processor. The new, the newest ones of these T9s have um, a uh, Alder Lake, which is the N100, which is also a Celeron. Uh, it's just a little bit newer. It has uh, a few more execution units in the video side of the chip, so uh, it has 24 versus 16. So that's good. And uh, you can get them with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of NVMe SSD, which means they're very fast. So they are for about $187. So you could buy about four of these for the price of one Mac Mini. Next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada writes in, if you have a USB audio interface connected to an iPhone, with that, uh, with that audio be used with the iPhone, with the phone is connected to an ATV as a continuity camera, i.e. real mic into a mixer, into iPhone, into Zoom on Apple TV. I go, go ahead, CJ. Yes, I slightly ran out of time. Well, uh, I saw your question come up and I actually grabbed a, an audio interface and plugged it in and hooked it up to the Apple TV. Um, all I know right now is that it doesn't have microphone selection within the Zoom app on the Apple TV when you have a uh, when you have an audio interface plugged into the iPhone via USB C. However, uh, what I didn't get to is trying to see if there was somewhere on the iPhone where I could select a different microphone. But right now, it does not look like it supports that. All right, go ahead, uh, Bill. Yeah, I, I was going to say it depends on whether the software designers of what you're using have allowed access to the full back end of the audio kit in in your computer. I, 
I would think maybe loopback might be one of the solutions that you could figure out how to pull that audio incorrectly. But I have not tried that with Apple TV. And this is definitely a test before you decide to pursue this. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, you would definitely have to test this with somebody on the other end. In theory, it should work even without mic selection because the moment you plug in an external audio, core audio compliant interface, that takes over the and will disable the built-in microphone. So you shouldn't have to select the microphone. It should just use whatever is plugged in. Next question. Andy Kokendorf for Enviera, Florida writes in for event services, do you plan to do you make a plan to view with camera positions and areas covered examples i go tj uh, absolutely i always want to know uh, if i'm going to have coverage if i have the time and i hope that i do i like to open it up and actually make a quick even a rough layout of the event in sketchup to scale and then you can actually uh and i'm sure there's a better program for this but this is the layman's way to do it uh, i'll put the you know eye view at the point where I want the camera position to be and actually set my field of view and what I want the distance to be. That way I can have an idea of what can this camera see in this space because you never know what if you're going to have time. If you don't have time to physically go there in person, then this is going to be the only way to do your previs. Hey, uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I just want to warn anybody who's worried about the camera positions. If you by chance have a cyber truck on the stage and Elon Musk is announcing as one of your presenters, make sure that your lights are high enough that if he on the spur of the moment decides to jump up into the back of the cyber truck to start talking, that there's light on his face because at the delivery event last week, that's what Elon Musk did. And I, and I saw him do it and he's literally, he's lit from the chest down and his face is totally in the black. I could just imagine the lighting guys going, why didn't somebody tell me he was going to do that? It was hysterical. Go no light on his face. It's, it's called. It's called rehearsal. Like, you know. <laughs> but he's not going to rehearse. He's no, I know. Mask. I know. That's the problem. That's the problem with with. That's generally the problem with a lot of executives is that they that you have a bunch of plans and then they they do something else. And so with those kinds of executives, we build a much larger grid. The problem is that my impression of how uh, the Musk companies work with some experience is that there's no rehearsal and the budget is razor thin and it is, so what you do is you, you only have the money to build exactly what you think might happen because there's, you know, for other shows that I work on, we just, the, there's an option for all over the stage and all over the, you know, there's just whatever the, the executive wants to do. If we're not gonna get rehearsal and the very, very best ones, and again, this is funny, I don't use any of their products. I don't work with them anymore. Uh, but Salesforce is the is the gold standard when it comes to you know building their presentations, um, and they uh, their their executives all the way to the top rehearse like crazy. They memorize almost everything that they're going to say, and they still have this huge lighting grid that lets them do almost anything that they want on those presentations, and um, and then then it works. But but you're right that if you do something where you don't spend enough money. To give the client, give the uh, give folks what what they need to be ready for whatever you're going to do, you're going to end up with people in shadow. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, it, this is a matter of time and resources. Should you absolutely, you should make a plan whenever you have the time and the budget re, uh, will compensate you for the time to make that plan. A lot of us have walked in though to a lot of shoots where we don't have time and we don't have resources. To me, probably the single most important thing is the site survey. If I can see the site, even if I don't have time to make a plan, I know pretty much in my head where I'm going to position cameras, where the lighting is, what's in the room, what do I have to bring. Uh, if I don't have the option of that, I'm going in cold. I remember I did a tour on the East Coast and I had to shoot in like five places, never seen them before. You just have to kit yourself to the point where you think you're carrying everything you possibly could and you're still going to miss it. But yeah, plan, plan, plan. Things go better when you plan if you can. Yeah. And, and for me, for like sketching things out, I have the things that I need the most for a really quick layout uh, actually in um, a Keynote. So let me pull this over here. Just like, so just I grabbed a couple of the shapes. So these are like in Keynote, it would be in my shapes, so to speak. Oh. 
Sorry. I went to, I went to, I dragged it over to show it to you and it literally has disappeared. Hold on. Um, <laughs> the like black I, hole I didn't, the desktop. I, no, like, well, I have these, you know, now that I, I, I unshared the spaces on my, on my things, it, it turned gray. So it said, I don't know what, I don't know what monitor it went to. <laughs> so, so hold on. <laughs> Let me, I'm just only laughing because I've here. done this so many times. It was such a great, <laughs> I, 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 Hold on. Oh, here it is. Here. Hold on. I found it. Hold on. <laughs> Dragged it um, off to somewhere and it got put on the margin of two screens with a little. Yeah. And then it just, and then it was like, I will. And it, yeah. So, so you put this in. There we go. So let me, um, <laughs> that was funny. It was just, just like I let go of it to drag it over. And then it was like gone. Um, so, yeah. so the, uh, so what I have here is, um, so this is, this is kind of what I have laid out. Now I can make these any colors because these are just shapes. So it's key. These are not JPEGs. They're not pings. They are actually defined as shapes inside of, um, and one of the things that, that has changed in, in uh, Keynote in the last version is that you can now, as you can import SVGs and make them shapes. Before it was a weird, the reason I don't have a, a, an object for absolutely everything I need is because I had to go through this thing called AV, uh, AI to key. <laughs> it's like this weird little open source uh, app to convert things to Keynote. So I didn't put everything in there. Now there's a couple things in here that I have. So I have like, oh, we're gonna use a drone, uh, which I've done. Um, I, I might show satellite trucks. Um, so for instance, I might go, well, we're gonna have, and I'll, I'll take this one. And because again, because it's a shape in Keynote, I can you know, change its color. If it's, if it's just an image, I can't do that. And so, um, so I can go in here now and just go, I want this to be you know, light gray. This is what this is gonna look like. By the way, the reason that I have a Earth, it's called, mine's called Earth Light, is because no one cares about Antarctica. We're not broadcasting from Antarctica. And so the regular Earth one on, on Keynote includes Antarctica, and I'm always like, Really? Like, and, and I, I, I get rid of Greenland. I know that, I know, because I'm not broadcasting. Oh, from you're going to get mail. And so it takes, it takes up a bunch of space up here. And, and so I'm like, when I'm talking about it, I don't need to do that. And so, um, so anyway, but then I might say, okay, and the truck is going to be, oh, this is going to be, send, I'm going to send this to the back. Um, the, the keynote has a different key, key for that. Anyway, um, so I'm going to have the little truck in here and I'm going to say, and then it's going to go to the cloud. And then it's going to come back to another truck, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, but but the uh, but I but I also have these little, and this, by the way, is is super high tech. It is a uh, uh, oval with a circle on top of it. But it, the key is to have it look like it's pointed in some direction. So this person is pointed in a different direction here, and I made that as just a keynote. Um, but in my shapes down here, I have just my shapes. And so I've got like lots of things that I might throw in there, you know, to, you know, not, not a ton, but I've got my sat trucks and I've got my camera and PT, uh, PTZ because a lot of times we have to define what we're using there. So anyway, um, a lot of times I will take a, um, I'll take a plan view of the stage and then I'll put those people on top of it. Like here's where they are. We'll put the cameras back here. We'll do the thing here. And it's really, really fast. Um, this isn't, I mean, for a lot of the shows that I do, we scan it with a LiDAR scanner. We, br we bring it into, into SketchUp. We have models of the objects that we put in there so that we can visualize all the spaces and everything else. We, we shoot plan views, but they're renders of the 3D model of with the 3D objects in them. But for most other ones, almost every event, I do some version of this where I just lay out so I can send somebody a picture that says, this is kind of what I'm looking at. Uh, what I'm having here, like if we do it, in, like we've done some stuff in movie theaters and I get the seats, you know, the, where the seats are and I, I put a big thing over them and I, I say, the, I make them a bunch of them red and say, we're killing these seats and this is where the cameras will go and this is where we're going to put people and et cetera. And it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Can I ask somebody to register alexesshapes.com? Alex, we're going to bundle these. We're going to make it. We're going to sell them for like five bucks. You're going to, it's your retirement plan. I'm telling you. Alexesshapes.com. Yeah, exactly. It will email you and, a zip file. You know, the funny thing is, is that I, I've had them for a long time. I, uh, I started doing it in, I, I mean, I still do some things in OmniGraffle. I do a lot of other things in OmniGraffle. But in, in OmniGraffle, um, I used to have hundreds of things. Like, it was all my, it was all my, mixers and switchers and everything else. Um, and I have to admit that I, you always start with all these pictures. You can always tell how long someone's been doing wiring diagrams because they all start with pictures and they all end up with boxes, like just, just boxes. Like I have, you know, like I just have a box with all the IO on the box because the pictures were too complicated. Like once you start building really complex pipelines, you're like, 
okay, I just need the boxes with the inputs and the outputs. I don't need to have it look like the object. Uh, go ahead, CJ. This is the great debate of how much how much uh, detail do you need versus how fast do you need to get uh, the layout done for the job. Alex put broadcast trucks all over the world faster than I drew your room, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, and when you do when you do it, when I do, when you do it a lot and you just want to and a lot of times I'll be sitting there talking I'll be in the meeting if I'm not talking putting together the diagram because it helps me think and if someone man if you give me a minute like if you send me a breakdown of what you want half an hour before the meeting I will definitely build a diagram because what it does is it helps me think about things it I I'm, I use it as much to think about it oh, I need one more person over here and then we're going to have an egress problem over there and then we're going to have this and where are we going to get power there and how are we going to do this? And so, you know, these aren't just done for clients. They're done for you to figure out what you actually are going to need. Um, and I color them differently. So I have like the the guests in one color and the staff in another color and that type of thing. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Alex just pointed out what I, I do. With, I don't do them for because I'm not uh, organizing the show, but I'll be a worker bee at the show. For my own information to figure out how much cable I'm going to need, I'll just go to the venue. I'll look up. I'll ask where the venue is going to be, and I'll go to like uh, uh, the ballroom layout. I'll just Google search ballroom layout of Lowe's Hollywood, and you'll see you know a lot of pictures show up of different uh, ways that they can lay out that that room, which would be very helpful. And they a lot of times they'll have actual plan views with uh, that are dimensions. So you can figure out how much cable am I going to need? Where am I going to locate the prompter operator? You know, where am I going to have to put the stuff on the stage? Uh, so that's very helpful. And anybody can you know, usually find those most larger venues uh, have posted on on their websites, uh, their their layouts of their event spaces. Yeah, go ahead and Chris. I'm sorry, uh, Mark. And a lot of things, you, a lot of times you can bring these into SketchUp. It's simple. You can draw on SketchUp in 2D. You can pop it into 3D, and but it's to scale. So you can start to dimension how many cables do you need, how far away are things, and you can put into plan the audience and things like that just to give you a sense of scale with your sketch. Yeah, and, and definitely for venues that we work in a lot, we do scan them. You know, And the other thing is, is that um, one of the great things about having a scanner is that, uh, like, uh, you know, some, even a, a little BLK 360s, which, which is what I have, is the one time that they let you into a space to scan is when you're about to do a show there. Like, hey, I'm the production company, blah, 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 blah. Um, and uh, can we, you know, just take some measurements? And they'll go, <laughs> I don't even say, that. can we do, LiDAR scan opens up a can of worms that I, I've learned not to do. Um, so I, um, I I just say, hey, can we take some measurements? And uh, and then when you come up there, they're like, hey, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it's it's just, a, it's, a, it's a measuring tool. It uses lasers to measure. And, and, and you just kind of leave it at that. And by the time, You've started talking about LIDAR, the whole place is all covered. And so then, and then you have um, the, you can use, you know, I've gone back to many venues where all those measurements and those models are really, really useful. The first time, it's, you know, a little bit painful. The second time and third time and fourth time, it's, it's, you have something that nobody else has, <laughs> which is the ability to not, not go in for a walkthrough and know exactly where everything's going to go. Um, the other thing that as you start looking at VR and so on and so forth, one of the other things that we've done with some of the hotels that we did, and we did this when we were doing early Oculus work, is actually get those models back into, we didn't have an app, so it was a little bit difficult because we had to load it in. It was kind of a little bit of a, that's why we don't do it all the time. But we'd let the, we'd let the um, client stand in their space with all the chairs and the stage and everything else and, and just see, this is what you want. <laughs> you know, like this is what it's going to look like. And uh, they can make so many decisions before we had people on the ground. And the reason we did this, the reason we got into doing this was because we were in, in Rwanda and we were in this big, this, um, the Serena, which is this, you know, a really nice hotel in Rwanda. And the whole thing was all set up and it was like an hour before the doors open and uh, 400 seats. And uh, so we look over and someone's yelling, no, 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 no. It should have been this way. It turns like 90 degrees. And I looked at it and I was like, well, it's too bad to be you. Like I was like, there's no, you know, everything's taped down. Like we're an hour out. You can get a lot of people to show up at a hotel in Africa. And, and so like suddenly there were like, I think a person for every four chairs um, in there ro rotating the entire stage, you know, over to, to make it right. And we were like suddenly pulling up all our gaff tape and moving all our cameras and everything else. And I was like, that's never going to happen again. And so for 
for quite some time after that, we would build 3D models and show people what they what it was going to look like so they could make a decision. And then we could lay it out for people. But the more people can see, we saw one, I had one in another uh, in a venue in Moscone where the marketing director came in and said, and looked at the space and said, the stage isn't deep enough. You need to make the stage deeper. And they're like, well, it's tomorrow. And he's like, it needs to be deeper. And they're like, it's going to be $400,000. We're going to have to do this the overnight call and we're going to get all this stuff. And he goes, okay. And um, $400,000 to extend the stage 20 feet. Now I will admit, made a difference, but it would have been great to do that in a drawing, you know, or in a rendering or in a, you know, have more discussions. And so the closer you can get to it looking like the real thing, the better. But these little sketches that I do, they're great for the cl camera crews and everyone else to just know what the expectation is. Um, next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada writes in, can an iOS shortcut app shortcut be saved as a standalone app and then be copied to an older iOS device that predates the shortcut app? Just trying to add utility to a first generation iPad mini before it becomes e-waste. You know, I have some of these older iPads. Number one is, no, I don't think you can do that. Um, number, you'd have to write something, you know, write may, you know, yeah, there's no, I don't think there's any shortcut that you can go back to. But the other thing is I have found that my, my older iPads are pretty clunky. <laughs> like you can get them to do clocks, but they're, they, you know, the ones that are 10 years old are, are not running very fast now, even when they're updated and everything else. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't try to do much with them. I, I shortcut, it could probably do. But, but you'd have to write something to do that. Um, shortcuts are pretty simple. The one thing that I would think about is maybe learning some rudimentary code so that you could, you could write something that would, that would go to it. Um, some, you know, that would probably, that's a very, the kinds of things that you're asking to do shortcuts, there's a lot of libraries for. So you might be able to do a call to do that as opposed to trying to, but, I, but getting a shortcut back there, I don't think is going to work. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I would just think that the, the earliest iPads, and if you're looking at a mini, they go back 10 or 12 years. I would think that the addressability of those early processors may, th there may be something in a in a piece of software as recent as Shortcuts, which was only developed a couple of years ago, may not reach back all the way to that mini. So I, I was looking really quickly to see if there was a compatibility chart anywhere. They don't really address this. Uh, at least I wasn't able to find it in the amount of time we have. So I, this is one of those, give it a shot and try, but don't have your hopes gigantically up there. I think the one thing that I would look for is if this, then that is a, is a program that runs on a lot of different Apple devices and um, it does a lot of automation calls. And I don't, yeah, I'm not sure, but I think that would be the thing that I would, I would, I would do some research on. Next question. Coming in from a QR code, Ryan Gordon in New York City writes in, looking for the most reliable uh, live streaming encoding app for my M1 Max MacBook Pro. I've tested it OBS, Mimo Live, and Ecamm so far. Biggest issue is lip sync drift for long streams. Tested each using CamLink 4K and Ultra Studio 3G for capture. Same results. So my question is, are you uh, editing on, doing anything else on that computer while you're doing those things? So... Um, uh, the Ultra Studio 3G should work. Uh, many of these things have worked for me. Um, uh, software, these kind of software solutions have worked over long periods of time. But the question is, are you doing anything else with it? Are you cutting the show on it? Are you doing graphics on it? Are you checking your email on it? As you do other things, you will you can possibly lose sync. So you just have to kind of keep keep that in mind. Um, the, if the computer is going over. 60% CPU utilization, you could be losing sync. Um, now with an M1 Max MacBook Pro, that seems very unlikely um, that you'd be going to doing a basic show, but take a look at what you're doing on the, on the thing. If you are only using it for encoding as an appliance, um, it shouldn't be, uh, uh, it shouldn't have any, pro it shouldn't have any problem staying in sync um, in that area. But you, if you're doing anything else with it and you're putting, especially if you're putting it for any reason, you're putting these pa these um, pieces of software in the background as opposed to the foreground. So you, you pull up text edit, you pull up an email, you pull up something else in the foreground while they're streaming, they're absolutely going to lose sync. <laughs> like, like they are like it's a hundred percent chance they'll lose sync. You to do good encoding from your computer, you need to treat it like an appliance. Like it is, this is what it does um, in that area if you expect it to stay in sync. Sync is, a, we used to have a problem with Wirecast. If you took the headset out, unplugged the, the headset from the computer, it would lose sync. <laughs> so so it, would, it, would just, it would just drop about a couple hundred milliseconds out of sync. So that's something you want to kind of think through. The, um, 
if you really want to get geeky about this, there are, you can start, you can, if you are willing to do all the things that are required, you can install FFmpeg into your, and do basically a command line solution to do this live streaming. And so that, that definitely can be done. There's some installs and, you know, or Unix stuff that you have to get done to do that. But FFmpeg can, can stream it and that's all it does. Um, I don't know a lot of software only things, and that's only if you're having trouble with these. And again, I'm, especially my, most of my experience on the Mac is with Memo Live. Um, now, I will admit that most of my streaming is done with appliances. So I use mostly elemental appliances to stream. So I don't, when I'm streaming something that for work, uh, it generally goes into a, an elemental appliance that doesn't know how to do anything other than stream. Um, but when I'm using my Mac for things that can, um, you know, that are more experimental, or I'm doing something like I do the podcast, um, Michael uh, Gray Matter uh, dot show with, uh, um, I do that with uh, Memo Live, and I don't notice any sync drop. Um, so, so anyway, so I think that that's. Uh, but I, but I would say look at whether you're using something else in the in the OS. And think about really dedicating a piece of hardware to it. And you can go low level like command line with something like FFmpeg. Uh, next question. John Snyder in Reno, Nevada writes in, how can I hear myself in Zoom the way that everyone else in Zoom would hear me? For example, after Zoom noise suppression. Go ahead, CJ. I don't know if there's any way to do it without any latency just because it's got to pass through the Zoom pipeline. I'm not sure if that's what you were looking for. I, what I usually, if I'm really concerned about it, I'll set up a separate machine uh, and have that be the receiver or just record the Zoom call. But I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, John. Go to Alex. Yeah, there's no uh, post Zoom processing monitoring option in Zoom. How the only thing I can think of is maybe if you turned, if you had the Zoom processing on, try the a a, a recording session in Zoom. Record like just create a test meeting, record that, play it back. You should have the Zoom processing applied to that, as far as I know, and then you can just gauge whether or not you like the way you sound with it. Good, Bill. As close as I've gotten, you you really can't do a virtual program monitor that is actually taking the Zoom broadcast and then feed it back. As everybody has said, there's just too much latency with all the post-processing being done. What I do and what a lot of people here do is I monitor off my uh, my interface so I can hear myself, my mic, and I can hear its noise reduction in my ear fed back to myself and then the show can come back to me through what the show does but i am not getting zooms processing because to achieve that loop back in would be a significant delay uh it's as close as we can as close as i've been able to get i really do i'm sorry that i can't get the the real program feed because that would be lovely but it's just i don't think physics makes it possible I mean, this is why I use a, a mix pre or one of the many reasons I use a mix pre is that I do everything in the hardware um, so that no matter what device I use, that whether I'm using or what software I use, whether it's Teams or Hangouts or Meet or whatever, or WebEx or Zoom, I know exactly how I sound going into the system. Um, and so I turn off all the, the garbly gook that everybody has in there. I will say that Zooms has gotten very effective um, at doing that, but I do agree that you can't, there's no low, there's no zero latency way to listen to it. Um, so uh, so you just have to, you, know, you, you would have to record it or put it, use a separate computer in that area. But again, that's why I focus so heavily on using a hardware device. Um, that's why all of my hardware devices are there and they're not software. This is why I don't do anything in software when it comes to those interfaces. I don't do any effects. I don't do any processing. Everything's in the hardware because that means no matter what, what piece of interaction that I have in the computer, it's all going to be the same. <laughs> like it's, you know, like I can switch, I can do switching and I can do other things and I can do all those things and it's all going to be, it's all going to do what I expect it to do. Next question. Coming in from the QR code, Anawaha He Black Bear Marshall in the Wahi Nation writes in, with another week of Sunday with no audio stream in the Sunday show now officially canceled for, uh, for this audience today uh, until the next year. So harsh. Um, so, so anyway, um, so uh, uh, we, you know, we're in the in the process of transition. Um, I do believe that the audio stream was working a little bit into the show, um, but I do apologize. We haven't gotten it all working yet. Um, we're going to make some changes to the back end infrastructure um, that hopefully will make it smoother for us to execute that. Um, uh, hopefully by next Sunday. So uh, this week we'll be uh, probably moving from. Uh, 
from IceCast to Shoutcast, and we're going to see how that goes. Um, uh, it just makes it a little easier for us to administer on our end. So, um, so stay tuned for that. And uh, we moved IceCast from Shoutcast because it was unstable a couple of years ago, but Shoutcast looks like they've made a lot of upgrades. So we're going to give them another uh, shot. It's easier for the, our whole team to administer. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to kind of move over to that. So hopefully that'll be working for your next show on Sunday. Next question. Coming in from the QR code, Dan Shaw in Columbus, Ohio, writes in helping a friend improve their Zoom audio for his online business as he does a lot of two-way group calls. Hoping for some hot takes on a mic, maybe the Shure MV7 using an XLR on an arm using a Focusrite Scarlett interface, SM7DB might be overkill. Uh, go ahead, uh, CJ. Your number one question to ask is what is the level of technical proficiency of your friend, because if it if he can't make it work, if he can't turn it on simply, then it doesn't matter what you're using. It's got to be uh, simple enough for the other person to use, or if the person's really uh, talented, then maybe you can make it more complex. But I would focus on usability first, then get to the mic. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so I would, no, you don't need an SM7DB. Um, it's an expensive microphone. There, the MV7X is the XLR version of the MV7. So if you're going to get an interface, I would suggest the MV7X. It is also less expensive. Um, you may also want to look at for an audio interface. This is a much better choice than the Focus, right? It's a little bit more money, but since you're in the U.S., it is on sale right now, 50 bucks off, the Lewitt Connect 6. And the reason why I always recommend this interface is because it is a lot more gain. So if you're going to use a low-output dynamic microphone like an MV7 or an SM7, uh, that is a much better option. It has full DSP processing too. The other thing for beginners is it can automatically adjust the gain of the microphone for you. So it has a setup wizard and it just will take 10 uh, seconds of uh, speech. It would listen to you and it will adjust the microphone volume. So you have the most amount of headroom. So even if you don't understand gain. And when it does that, it's not, that's not a true auto gain, which means it's not pulsing, right? It's not breathing. It's just taking a sample and then locking it. Or is it? Yes. Is it? Yes. Yeah. It's just, and it just sets it and locks it in. That's, that's your mic levels. The other cool thing, if we look at the back here, is they have a uh, USB-C mobile output. And now they have an app for iOS and Android, which allows you to send audio directly to your device. And you can live stream uh, through this app to various platforms. And you can also have it simultaneously connected to your computer because it has two USB-C ports, which I think makes it quite valuable. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, that's a cool interface. But to CJ's point, I'd keep it simple, use the USB. And if I bought a mic, it'd be an MV7 with the XLR and the USB. Start with the USB. Uh, if it doesn't work for you down the road, you can always put an interface in the system. Uh, Good, Bill. I just wanted to say, don't don't obsess on exactly the right mic because there's 100 mics that'll do this job well they're all in the professional thing. You want to stay away from the really low-end, cheap stuff. If you're paying $30 for a mic, yes, you're going to have major problems with it. But I did most of my early voice work for commercials that were broadcast in studios on the outside. I would walk in the studio. I had no idea what mic they were hung, and I stood in front of probably 30 different models, and they all worked just fine. Um, your performance and your technique, particularly you know, if the friend that you're helping does not have any experience with this – I might slap a headset mic on them because I want that distance from their mouth to the capsule to be consistent, even if they're turning and doing demos and everything. Those are things that people who aren't used to doing this kind of work mess up because they turn off and they try to figure out whether they're picking something up and they go away. And the technique is as important as the mic. And anything you can do to eliminate those variables can be a good thing. Thank you, Courtney. We haven't uh, talked about it, I don't think, here, and I haven't certainly tried it, but Zoom has this uh, USB interface for like 80 bucks, that, and they've had some pretty good, uh, their, their more recent uh, preamps have improved considerably. This is a single mic uh, preamp, uh, a USB interface. It's bus powered or battery powered, so it can be powered off the USB connection. Uh, it has separate gain and output control, and it has separate headphones for monitoring. Uh, your and it has a high impedance or low impedance input. It has phantom power. 
that's all the good stuff you'd need for connecting a, a higher quality microphone to a computer. So you might look at that. No, no drivers required works cross platform uh, with a single uh, XLR or TRS or mini input as a line input. Uh, so you might look at that and it's a cheap way to try it out and you can interface it to both, you know, 48 volt phantom powered mics and uh, you know, like sure dynamics. It's interesting in the Lewitt uh, d documentation, they said, you know, it has an easy control center for loop back. And I thought that that meant that it was going to loop back, but it's some, it has decided that they're going to use some other, they're going to use that term to describe something else. I was like, oh, that's going to be problematic. Um, anyway, so, um, so if you're, if you're watching um, a rogue amoeba, <laughs> I want to call them, um, you know, the, the one thing I will say is that the, you know, I, I, I think that it does, you know, what we send out is um, the MV7s um, and we send out MV7s because we can go USB or XLR um, and it generally works. You know, like when we send these mics out, it generally works well. Um, and if someone is relatively close to the right place, um, it works well. And so it's a little bit more expensive, but it does. Um, it, it means they don't need an interface to, to get into their computer. Um, and so that's been pretty uh, successful for us. Um, so the, um, but I, I do think I'm really interested in the connect six, I have to admit, and now looking at it, um, I do think that it does, it does matter about like the level of geekiness. I still think that the, there's a version of, of something that wants to be around the cost, maybe a little less than the connect six that is even simpler than that. For instance, the average person plugging in doesn't need XLR outs or, or, or TRS. They don't need speaker outs. <laughs> like, you know, like when are they going to actually do that? And so there's like, and you could reduce that and still keep on reducing the complexity and again, making it remote. But I do think that the, the Lewitt one looks really impressive um, as far as how to relatively, it worries me that anytime it's some, when I'm sending to someone simple and it says there's a Mac software to run it, I get worried. Um, you know, like that's the, that, that always kind of is a red flag for me because um, it's, it just means another thing that someone has to do. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I was just going to say the the app is actually pretty well designed. But the the nice thing with the app, though, is you could just VPN a remote desktop into that person's computer and just help them set it, it up. So that is it, an advantage. It could be <laughs> like, like like it's just that it's the the um, you know, the thing that I miss, you know, I don't know if I have one with an arm's reach, but I. Oh, yeah, I do. Um the, uh, I mean, the the workhorse that we use for years, and it, it doesn't have a lot of the cool features that all the other cool kids have now. But um, at one point, I had, I don't know, I had a whole rack full of these. These are USB, these are uh, USB pre twos, and the great thing is the way to change the settings were. Um, let's see if I can get my head out of the way here. Dip switches. <laughs> so, so you could do dip switches here. I know I sound, uh, back in the day, we had these things, but you could run this over with a truck and then capture a podcast with it. Um, anyway, so, but, uh, but the advantage was when we sent it to someone, it was in a state that it was going to stay in, you know, and they, and we could see everything on the front anyway. So that's, I feel like there's something in between all of these things that wants to be done. I know that's not answering your question. I do think that the Lewitt looks really good. I think having an all-in-one mic helps to at least have it available. So the advantage of an MB7 is that if your interface is having trouble, especially if you're using a Scarlett, because if you're not technical and you're using a Scarlett, you are going to have trouble. Um, the You can route, just a, just plug in a USB on the other end of it. The other thing to look at is, is for, as far as interfaces go are, we talked about this in the past, but the MV... X2U. This is a little XLR input that you just shove in the back of the mic, and now you have a USB connection to it. Um, so think about that as well. Go ahead, Mitchell. If they could only put noise assist into that uh, old sound devices device that you have, that would be a perfect web audio system. Uh, it would be. It would be a good start. Uh, I mean, you know, I think that you. I do think that you want a web. I think you want a. I mean, to, the, the funny thing is I usually go against this, but I do think that having a network, like a, you can open up a web page and get to the all the controls, like reduce all of the dials on the front. This is even has too many, um, but have e everything just be like there's a big knob for volume and there's a big knob for, for your volume and a m knob for your mix. That's all I need you to do. You want a black <laughs> That's box. All I need. You know, and, and then and then if you want to administer your own device, you open up a web page and give it give it an address and it just opens up and you you change the things that you want to change. But otherwise you're not you're not interacting with it directly because then you can send it to someone, don't tell them what that web page is and it'll just work. So anyway, next question. 
Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York writes in, due to budgetary reasons, I'm using OBS as a graphics send via NDI to vMix. I want to incorporate L3s in OBS, but I'm having trouble uh, with that doc in OBS not showing up as a source to send my program or to my program feed. Any advice? I guess my only question is, why are you not using the vMix tools? Like there's, there are lower third vMix tools that are there. So if you already have, if you don't have vMix, I understand why you'd be using OBS. But I don't think there's anything that OBS can do that vMix can't when it comes to like lower thirds. So this, I, I know that I'm not answering your question. I don't know why it's not showing up. But, but what I will tell you is I don't know why you're doing it. Like I don't understand why you would want to, separate those two things. So I would recommend really looking hard at the vMix tools because they're pretty good when it comes to lower thirds. Uh, next question. John Wallace in Michigan writes in, uh, what is the latency of the Sony FX3 cameras HDMI output? I'll be using these and a few Atmos recorders before the ATEM for an event this weekend. Sync will be an issue between cameras that don't have Atmos, I assume. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, I have the FX3, which is the second cousin to the FX30, which Alex has. Um, I notice no uh, latency issues. Uh, and if it is, it's negligible. 30 milliseconds. Now, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Most of the HDMIs on a camera feed is not going to be your latency problem. It's going to be somewhere downstream from that. But it is 30 milliseconds. Like We've measured it. <laughs> I had to measure it the last week, actually. <laughs> so, so, the, uh, so it's not exactly 30 milliseconds. I think it's like something like 20 something or other. But it's, it's about a frame um, that you lose. And, and that's coming from the sensor. When you really think about it, it's coming from the sensor to the output. Um, we also found out that a Blackmagic 12K has about 38 milliseconds of, of delay from the time it hits the sensor to the time it comes out the SDI feed. There's, it's losing about a frame. Now, if you embed your audio into the camera, you don't see that latency because it's being embedded with the process, but we do see a little bit of latency and you will see more latency if you're running it through another device. Every device that you buy, you know, you're going to lose a little bit. Now, sometimes it's not a lot. It can be 10 milliseconds or 15 milliseconds as it goes through. If you're doing any scaling, you can expect a couple frames, uh, one or two frames of, of loss if you're scaling. So if you go into that Atomos at 4K and, and come out of it at... Um, uh, at 1080p, you're going to lose a couple frames there. And so that's why you have to really measure at the far end of what you're doing, you know, front end to far end. Um, I measure when I'm doing an event that matters, I have someone, you know, with an iPad or something else that's, that's playing there or they're doing P words. We have, we have a thing that we have them read. Um, but the main thing we do is the, the easiest way to do this is to, is we bring up, have someone take one of the little slates where you can close it. And they walk up to that slate and they just go whack. And they, and they, um, but what we do is we grab the actual HLS um, uh, segments from the, you know, from the, from our encoders or from YouTube. And we met, we take them into an NLE and measure the difference between the two. You know, and so, so that is the, and that's how we know exactly what, what it is without using something like a matchbox, which is amazing. Um, but oftentimes the matchbox, what we found is that it doesn't measure all the latencies like the camera latency we just talked about. So you put the matchbox into where the camera is, but you're not calculating the fact that it's going through an Atomos and it's going through this and it's going through this other thing and everything else that gets there. So truly having something on the end, uh, matchbox does have a, uh, a, a, a device called a, a glass, which is a iPad that goes up there, and that will measure all the way through. Um, next question. Coming in from the QR code, Dan Sean, Columbus, Ohio writes in, looking to help a friend improve their video quality game with Zoom and could use some hot take recommendations. It seems most webcams are not great, but this friend is not an AV nerd, so it needs to be simple and not break the bank. Uh, let's go pretty quickly, lightning round. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, it's easy for us to spend your friend's money. My hot take is that if you set the webcam at the appropriate level and have good lighting, you'll be able to have better picture than 80% of people at no cost. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. Super simple. Get a Logitech Brio. It's it's consumer-ish, but it has a nice thing, and it does HDMI and or USB. Uh, and go ahead, Mitchell. I'd like to add to internet video of lighting and sound, I'd like to add autofocus to the list. So go Sony. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, I, I, uh, um, I would, I would use either a link, a Insta360 link or a Brio are the, are the two that I, you know, those are the two best simple, relatively simple ones. The Brio being simpler, the link being easily twice the video quality of the, of the Brio at this point. 
Uh, we're going to be jumping into growth and workforce management next. Um, just a quick reminder, of course, that we have uh, a, a second part of our lab is coming up on t- uh, tomorrow. Uh, we <laughs> we ended up answering questions the whole time, and we didn't get to actual talking about lower thirds. So uh, so we're going to so Alex uh, Goldner is going to be back, and we're going to be talking about uh, lower thirds in motion. Uh, we're going to have a lab on the X32, and just talking about the X32, the Behringer X32, on Wednesday. Um, uh, Thursday, um, we are uh, going to be building LUTs. How do we build LUTs for Sony's and Blackmagic cameras and maybe a couple others? Um, so we'll be talking about that on Friday, of course, is the power hour. Um, we're going to, how do we manage power within our production studio and in the field and in the studio? Saturday, of course, is our weekend Q&A, and Sunday is introspection, where you can ask questions about what are we doing here? Welcome back to the second hour. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, how to manage growth. I mean, this has been, you know, a lot of us get started and you don't think that you're going to ever get to that point. You're a freelancer, uh, you're doing your thing and and it's all going well. But the real problem is, is that eventually you get two jobs at the same time, three jobs at the same time. And when you say no to a client, you know, they go somewhere else and they may not come back. So you, you know, being a single you know, person doing this stuff uh, has its own challenges. And so you start hiring people to help you. First, you have some freelancers and then you have some other folks that are helping. And then eventually you start to figure out you might have to create a business for this. And um, and you end up, um, you know, building up. And if you're lucky, you do it relatively slowly so that you have time to do that. Um, if you're not lucky, you get a bunch of work coming in and you start growing quickly. And that can be really, really hard to manage. So if you've got questions about how to make this work. We've got a great panel here to talk about it. Um, and I'll let John go ahead and jump in and uh, kick it off. Yeah, writ large, this process is what we call for, um, workforce management. And there's four areas to the discipline of workforce management primarily. First, you start with a forecast. You have to forecast both your supply as well as your demand. Um, and depending on what your product is, that can be trickier one way or another. Then there's scheduling. You have to make sure you have the right resources, especially human resources, to make sure you have the right people in the right positions with the right training at the right time. Then while you're doing the work, you need to monitor your resources to make sure that the work that's happening is how you would expect it to be. And then lastly, you need to analyze or build reports to make sure that what you predicted at the beginning holds true today so that when you predict the future again with your next forecast, um, everything lines up. So those are the four main areas I think of when I think of workforce management or planning for the future. Yeah. And and I think that the one of the hardest things, there's a couple of things that I find to be particularly difficult. Um, and if you have questions about this, go ahead and throw those in. Um, the One of the challenges um, in this area is you know, the resources related to space, IT infrastructure, but also, but the most, the hardest one is people. How do you find the, the people to do what you need to do? Um, now, what I tend to do is build training systems <laughs> so that I'm doing this all the time. I'm building up networks all the time. Um, you know, when, uh, so I had a situation where I spent, you know, uh, about a decade building the, a pixel core as far as a training program. And there were, um, you know, 2000 people and they were, they were all, you know, kind of interacting with the process when the, the, that seemed like a lot of wasted time, except that when Google suddenly showed up and said, we need to do, you know, a lot more work, I had to go from six people to 30 people in a couple months, you know, and, um, you know, and they had to be doing very high quality work. And the ability for me to light up people all over the world and be able to, you know, staff up very, very fast. And it all came in out, 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 of, out of that training program. You know, like I, I already knew them. I already knew what they're like. I already knew where they lived. I already knew, you know, all the, th- you know, I knew that I, I had, I had like members like with the president of Mexico and Mexico City and, and the, and, the, and but they, they've been people that I had known for years because we were part of that community. Um, and so building, being part of a larger event, you know, community is super, in my opinion, super important not just to, I mean, th- people think about networking to get jobs, but I think about networking to find people, like find people for my next thing, my next project, whatever is, you know, I'm constantly investing in the community, both here in office hours and in other places where I'm constantly meeting people, but I'm not really looking at it so much as can I get a job or get more work from it? I'm looking at identifying talent, you know, like how do I find people um, that know this and this person knows that and, and I can reach out to that person to do something for me. And it and and all that investment is worth it when it when I need it. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah. So um having 
Uh, so I'd agree with everything John said, and and, and you, the the I think the I thought you were gonna say I thought you were gonna say I agree with everything John said. Alex is just like, <laughs> went off the rails, but but we'll ignore that anyway. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to extended operations, most stuff uh, is easily manageable as people have tools and technology and process to deal with it. I think the particular challenge comes in when you have explosive growth, when you have uh, a big contract for something coming in. I think the, the I've seen a lot of times, including my own, where you almost overspend and you hire crazy. Uh, and the thing to keep in mind with a lot of this, especially in the fast growth and hiring, is you know these are real people. They've got lives and families, and so when we do hiring, uh, I'm always looking to if I'm doing fast expansion, I'm looking at contracts first because fast expansion may also be fast you know, shrinkage. So uh, it's easier to have a buffer of uh, contract folks that are expecting not to be on for years at a time. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, it, to me, my career arc is, I look back at it and I think the first part of it was building me. And then you start adding more people into what you're doing and you're building we. And then for me and later in my career, it was going back to building me, getting better at managing the we. But that to me was the heart of whether I was satisfied or dissatisfied. When I got into the managing we thing, I always felt like I had lost a little of not just the control, but the satisfaction of applying my creative talent to solving problems because suddenly I was trying to herd a bunch of people trying to solve bigger problems. And I kept getting pushed away and away and away from the things that I loved about being a creative professional, making things up and executing on my own. So for me, there was always a challenge there. So I just want to make sure that everybody, you know, workforce management and doing this thing and growing your business is a wonderfully fulfilling thing if you're comfortable with moving through those stages. If you're not, I just found that there were times when I said, okay, that's as far as I'm going with this thing because all I'm becoming is a manager of others and I'm not able to do the work that I love to do before. And to be able to get to the point where I could bring some of that back in and be more creative – and I'm not saying workforce management is not creative. That is entirely the not the message you should be getting this because people who are good managers are extraordinarily creative, fabulous problem solvers, and should be very fulfilled with doing that job well. But it's a different thing. And I think that we, I thing is just something you should note in the back of your mind. That's just my two cents about this. Well, and as fast as you can, I mean, I think that when you're very small, you're going to end up being, it's a very... Uh, egalitarian system. There's a handful of you working together. Uh, the the roles Amen. don't matter. As you grow, it starts to become something where you start to have to have infrastructure. And the one thing that you have to decide as a, as someone who's starting to that's starting to run your company, am I the person to do that? And generally, the answer if you started your company, the answer is no. No, you're not the right the one to do that. What what made you good at? Um, getting started and 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 turning corners and and doing all those things generally makes you not a great manager um, of people. Um, and and so I found that I mean, now I can work with people. I can you know I had teams that I worked with, but I very quickly had people who uh, were managing the managing the finances, managing you know the basic HR requirements, managing so that I could stay nimble and continue to work with clients and continue to do the things that. That I that made money for the company, and I wasn't getting bogged down in those things. The other thing is, you don't always want the same person to have <laughs> all the conversations with everybody. Like with clients, I don't want to be the person asking them to pay their bills. Like I want to be the person they call when they, um, you know, when they have an idea, regardless of where billing is. You know, accounts payable is. I want to be the person that they they want to call and brainstorm with. Um, I don't want to be, and that's in any role that I'm in. Um, with with, uh, I want to be talking about the tech, but I don't want to be dealing with people's like the idea is having HR. You know, that's a that's a conversation for HR, and you just go just talk to them. I don't like that's not, that's outside of my my purview at this point. And getting out of that is really takes a lot of stress off, and it actually it works pretty well as you get to a certain point. But you know, it's there's somewhere I found, and um, you know, everyone here can jump in and say one thing or the other. But I found that. There was somewhere between 15 and 25 is when you switch gears to you start having some infrastructure. And we didn't quite get to 50. I was at about, um, you know, mid 40s. 
uh, in pixel core. And um, I, I knew that we were getting to another point to shift gears again, <laughs> you know, like where somewhere over 50 people, it was going to be a bunch of new requirements. And, and some of that has to do also with the, you have to remember the size of your company changes the regulations of your company. So um, I have to admit that in California, there was a lot of rules and regulations that occurred. And we knew when that was, that was at 50 employees. And um, so we kept our numbers below 50 because I just didn't want to deal with the extra paperwork. And so we were, you know, we would extend out to freelance. And it's not that we were never going to go over or we were trying to avoid it, you know, like the plague. We were just kind of like, we will avoid it until we're really ready, you know, until we're, until we've got lots of freelancers and we've got lots of revenue and we didn't quite get to where we needed to go. And, and, and again, that's a, to kind of put it in perspective, that was 40, 40 some employers with, you know, about $8 million of revenue. So at an $8 million company, we were like, we're not that big, <laughs> you know, yet to, you know, big, big, uh, we're not big enough to um, want to go, you know, to cross over that, uh, that, that, that cross, you know, that, that beam. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, and it's very easy to say that having a higher demand for your business is a good thing uh, until you realize everything that that means for you in the meantime. And I think both Bill and Craig hit on this is humans are different. They're different from each other. So if you are a one person business, that doesn't mean that hiring another person makes you as efficient. As you grow your company, your company becomes less efficient over time until you can start specializing your roles. Um, and then the people are still less efficient technically, but because the roles are specialized, like you have a group of, say, TDs or a group of specifically trained um, agents in a call center, you don't get efficiencies of scale overnight is what I'm getting at. And you have to take that into consideration in your overall planning, including choosing when to say, no, I'm not going to accept this incoming business because I can't staff this at a way that makes sense for anybody. Well, and the hard part, and the hard part is, is, and that's why a large freelance network was so important for us is to be able to expand and contract with the needs that were there, um, was that, you know, the, there are certain clients that we had that it was basically, we would say yes every time they called. Now, we would turn other things down um, because of that, but there were, you know, and so we had to grow at the speed that they wanted to grow at, you know, because if we didn't want somebody else doing that work, you know, like we wanted to stay in the middle of that. And so you end up with, and that's where constantly training and constantly reaching out into the community. It, I think a lot of a lot of people that run companies or part of companies don't realize how important being part of their production community, especially in this world, their production community is. They think of it as just as well. I don't need any more work right now because I'm busy. So why would I need to network or whatever? You need to network all the time because you're looking for the next people. You're looking for, you know, and, and if you can build training programs and build volunteer programs like what we've done here and what we did at Pixagore, uh, you, ha you have a very good idea of what people can and can't do and what they're willing to do and whether they're going to show up on time and whether they're going to, you know, you know, how they're going to interact with other people. Um, you know, one thing that that stuck with me was when I when I went to work at one place, they flew me in and I didn't feel like there was any interview at all. They flew me in. They wandered around. They showed me things. They, you know, talked a little bit. Um, I didn't really talk to anyone. And then they, then they said, okay, great, thanks. And I got home and I got, a, I got an offer to work there. And, um, and I realized they just wanted to see what I was like. Like they had decided technically I could do what they wanted to do. Am I going to fit into the team? You know, and, and so, and I think that a lot of times, uh, I've made the mistake of hiring people that are highly technical, that are not very good team players. And um, that is probably the biggest mistake that you can make is get caught up with, well, that person's really good at what they do, but they're really difficult to work with. And um, that has been, uh, you know, I was I was reading an article over the weekend about, um, they, they think that uh, Neanderthals were actually, they may have been smarter <laughs> than, than, uh, than the, than the uh, usurpers coming up <laughs> from the south, um, and um, and um, uh, so Homo sapien, you know, came up and and they think that they might have had bigger brains. They might have actually been able to do more, but they think that there's a there's a working theory right now that they just weren't as nice. <laughs> they just weren't they weren't as nice, and and they uh, and they didn't interact with each other, and they didn't share as much amongst themselves. And you can be, uh, but the, 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 it turns out that being nice or being uh, affable and being and social um, made more of a difference. And the math was, is that if someone learns how to fish and only tells one person, then, two, then not a couple people know how to fish and no one else does. If someone teaches everybody, or half the people that they know how to fish, within a very short period of time, everybody knows how to fish, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, and so, the, and, and that society has a tendency to be uh, a, 
uh, a more su- successful society. And, and so they think that it, it, it might have come down to that. And they did, they've done a bunch of research on that. And it's a really interesting article. But, but it really gets you into most HR companies will pay attention to what you know. They need, you, they need to know that. But they really need to know, are you going to fit into the, into the puzzle um, or not? If you're, are you going to fit into the team that they have? Um, and if they don't think that, you're probably not. You know, but you have to, as a company, it's really tempting to go, I'm going to hire the most skilled people I can find. And sometimes the most skilled people are not the right answer. You need, I guess the last thing I'll say before this is, is that you need a, uh, I poke very experienced, very, very people who are very, very good at what they do, if they're willing to share with other people what they know. And then I surround them with people who have a lot less experience. And that's, and so the thing is, is that that one person, I try to take as much of the to-do stuff off of their plate so they can just be who they are and interact with that and make corrections and so on and so forth. And then I have other people doing stuff for them, you know, that are, that are around them that are learning the whole time. And it's usually my ratio is about one for every three. So there's about three people for every one really, really high, um, uh, you know, you know, highly, tr- you know, experienced, oftentimes 10, 20, 25 years of experience, 30 years of experience, in some cases, 40 years of experience, surrounded by people that are coming out of school. <laughs> you know, and, um, uh, and, and, and oftentimes we found that to be really, it brings the people that came out of school up really fast. Um, and, and then with them, you're able to kind of mold more of a comp- company culture and then you kind of give the, um, the more experienced folks a little bit of a wide berth and let them do the thing that they do, uh, even if they don't quite fit in. Um, and, but you're building the company culture around the folks that are, that are coming up into the system where that are a lot less experienced. Go ahead, CJ. We're constantly reevaluating our staff and reevaluating our people, trying to figure out: Is this person in the right place? Have I surround? Have I put them, this individual, in a situation where they're making the people that are around them better? And when my, if I had a team that was maybe two or three people, that uh, I have a really versatile person who's in there that can do a lot of things. They're kind of a jack of all trades, and they can wear a lot of different hats. When you start to grow and four or five years down the road, you've surrounded that really versatile person with three or four people who uh, maybe aren't as versatile, but are really good at a specific task. Well, I need to make sure that that versatile person doesn't feel like I'm taking things away from them as a punishment. I'm trying to open them up to being able to do other things. And sometimes it's really, it's balancing that people aspect of, okay, the needs that I had for this person today aren't necessarily going to be the needs in five years. I just need to fig- make sure that I'm constantly making sure that their trajectory is, uh, is balanced. And you've got to also, you're going to find your time is balanced as well. Uh, you are going to do a lot more making when it's really a small group of people. But as you, as that team grows, you, you're going to have to split more of your time between the maker and the manager and figuring out how do I make sure that since there are more people and I'm not physically here all the time if we're traveling or if we're busy or if I'm not having as much one-on-one time with all of those individuals, how do I make sure that my vision and my culture is still echoed loud and clear so that that, because if I don't do that, if I don't set the tone and set the vision and spend that time making sure the right people believe in what I believe and have the same core values that I have, then a subculture is going to foster and you're going to lose a little bit of control of, of, of the identity of your business. Yeah, absolutely. Go, Craig. Yeah. So, you know, I guess I'd make another note or a plug for for contractors. Uh, you know, East, when I started, everybody was expecting to be full time employees, but nowadays there's a lot more uh, gig economy type stuff where people are okay being a contractor, uh, and there's definitely some advantage of it advantages of it as far as being like uh, a specialized skill, as CJ said, or uh, off hours where the sort of global remote work can really help. Um, and then there's just the standard cash flow issues. If, you, if you're doing really fast growth, a lot of times if you're hiring full timers, they need to be paid now, whereas contract, they invoice you and there's a uh, delay cycle in the cash flow. So it can help from that perspective. So really looking hard at, do they need to be an employee right now? Or can we do a try before we buy kind of thing with contract work? 
Yeah, and the problem is, you know, in the law, a lot of those laws, California being probably the most restrictive, a lot of those laws are how long can they be a contractor before you have to hire them? Sometimes it's three months or six months or one year. Um, sometimes you're working for a company that manages that for for the company. So one of the things is you can't necessarily hire someone as a contractor for a long period of time, but a big company can will hire another company to do all the payroll. Like basically you're getting hired by another company that then that then goes into the large company. And the reason they, they do that is to separate themselves from that. They don't have to deal with it. Um, I know that as a company that was contracted with a lot of those companies, I was a gray badge and a red badge and a blue badge and a yellow badge and an orange badge. I vastly preferred it. I would never want to work at the <laughs> full time at the companies that I actually, that I was actually contracting for. And I love the fact that I could just bounce around and go through those things. And so that wasn't a really, um, that was not a big deal for me. And I think that for some people it's a big deal and for some other people it's not a big deal. Um, I will say that I do agree with a lot of stuff that's been said here is that, you know, managing your workforce and how many people um, you have in it is super important. If you get under, if you're under resourced, the problem you get into is you, you're turning down jobs or you're not doing jobs as well as they need to be done because everyone's overworked and they're missing things because they don't do it. If you over resource, obviously you have a um, a nut that you, <laughs> you, have a, you have a problem with cash flow and cash flow is everything you know, in a company, like it doesn't matter. We had a problem where uh, our company grew so fast when we took on a large client that we were outrunning our receivables. So we were basically, because we were increasing by 30 to 50% a month um, for a couple months, for six months, we were just like, just in this, this, you know, this hockey stick. And so what we had to do to make that work is factor our, our factor, which is a really embarrassing thing to do. You go to a bank, and they'll give you money on your invoice, and that, but then all the billing has to go to them, and it just really, it doesn't look good, you know. But a lot of little companies might go through that if you don't have investment, you don't have credit, you don't have all those other things that you need um, to make that work. Um, as far as the the management, I think that, um, you know, as far as pr preserving culture, I will say that the thing that I didn't do well to start with was a lot of communication. I tended to be very separate from everybody and let everything go on. And the companies that I've seen do well, the C suite especially the CEO is out there talking to people all the time. You know, they're paying attention to, you know, some of the best restaurants. I learned this, I was watching and really had me thinking about it. There's this great restaurant um, called North Beach Restaurant in, in North Beach. <laughs> and, and it was huge. <laughs> the, the, the owner won it in a poker match. Anyway, in the 60s or whatever. Um, anyway, he, um, but he did not miss a day. Like he was there every single day, except for like two or three days a year. He was there and he built it up to be a really powerhouse of a, and he has a vineyard. He had a vineyard and all these other things. But, you know, it took that level of attention to kind of move a restaurant through that process. Now, you can definitely want to delegate and you want to have more people that you can trust to manage those things. But there's something about the the CEO making, you know, I've seen, you know, we've done a lot of all hands for a lot of um of CEOs. And um, it really makes such a huge difference when they're out there every week, every month, every couple of weeks, you know, talking to their employees and answering their questions. There's one company that does it every week and they, their CEO, it's a big company, their CEO gets up there and answers any questions that come up and just talks about them in front of the, every, every, you know, it's an all hands for an hour or whatever. It makes a huge difference in keeping everybody going the same direction. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. I just want to build on what Alex said uh, earlier on about hiring technical people that are really good at their job, but they're difficult to deal with. And that's something that I've had to grapple with over the years and had to shift my my hiring strategy because I would always look for people specifically in, in my industry that work that have to work in a PA rental department. You know, I would always look for people with live sound experience and, and know something about audio. But the problem that I ran into this is that some of these people lacked tact and they had certain soft skills that are missing. And I can train anybody on how to learn audio, but what I can't teach them is those other soft skills and that becomes a challenge in your workplace. I had one guy that, um, you know, he really knew what he was doing, but he would spend far too much time just chit chatting with customers. He was really, really slow and he would, he wouldn't pay attention to details. He would, you know, not give people what they, what they needed for the gear and mess things up. And, and it, and it became a problem. And actually lately I have a fantastic person that I hired. Uh, we actually promoted him internally, moved him from one department to another 
because we knew what he was capable of. He didn't really have a lot of audio experience, but I knew that he cared about details. He paid attention to details. I don't have to ask him. I love that when people just do stuff and I don't have to ask them for those things. Yeah, we... We used to joke to you, you can't pick their parents. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's a certain level of you have to decide what they're going to be able to do and what they're not going to be able to do. One thing, though, is that oftentimes someone doesn't fit into a place, but they fit somewhere else. And so, you know, you have to also be open to the fact that you're using them wrong. Like, you know, this is, they may they may be a scalpel, not a hammer. <laughs> like, you know, and if you keep on using them that way, they're not, they're going to cut things in the wrong place and everything else. I had a, we had a, uh, I had an employee that broke a lot of stuff in the warehouse and just clumsy, dropped things a lot, was a little bit, dis, dis, you know, and I was like, I'm just going to put you behind a computer. I, admittedly, I wasn't sure if they'd get another job, like if, if I let them go. And I, um, and so I was like, I'm going to put them behind a computer and just give you some, here, how, why don't you build models of all of our equipment? Because I was just afraid that they, they wouldn't get another job. <laughs> you know, if they, if they left my, turns out they were like a rain person when it comes to SketchUp and would just model everything to incredible detail. Um, and just sit, sit, and so then I just started throwing things at them and it was, it was, it was a huge value to the company. And I just realized how quickly I had been misusing a, a very valuable resource. Um, and I was using it the wrong way, you know, I was holding on to the wrong end. You know? and so, so the, uh, and so that, that person turned out to be really valuable in a lot of the stuff. And it, it really, they built our approach to how we do SketchUp and how we pre and how we, everything else, um, um, they just weren't the right fit for the warehouse um, in that in that area, and um, and I think learning, you know, learning that about like a lot of times I'm trying to look at people that I'm working with and try to figure out where they fit. It's not that they don't fit; it's just they don't fit here, you know. Like, and and what do they love to do? And it's not a matter of I don't try to get employees generally to be something that they're not. Like, I don't, I'm not trying to train them to be a different kind of person. I'm trying to find a place that they fit where who they are, by the time they're adults, it's really who they are makes sense in that place. <laughs> you know, and so, and, 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 and taking advantage of that skill set and not, not asking them as much, there's times when there's going to be a pinch and you're asking them to do something that's, not comfort, that's outside of their comfort range. But really I'm trying to find where are they comfortable? Where do they feel expressed? Where are they excited about it? Um, and, uh, and, and sometimes you move people around and then you realize they just, that you don't have a place. It's not that they aren't a good employee. They're just not a good employee for for you. Um, but, but a lot of times, uh, I would say the vast majority it's finding, just finding a place that they fit. And again, for some people who are highly technical and difficult and oftentimes, you know, one of the problems we get into is we have producers who will complain about the, uh, employees not doing all the things, not filling out their paperwork and not doing their this and not doing that and everything else, but they're really good at running a camera or they're really good at doing. And my whole thing is, is find someone to support them. <laughs> you know, like don't, like don't make them do the things that they're bad at, you know, figure out what they're good at and then give people, you know, figure out a support thing that works for them so that they can be them. Um, because a lot of times that's why we hired them is we want them to be able to do those things. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. So I remember the day that I sat down, I had a really nice, lovely conversation with one of my CEOs that I was working for who, uh, the, I guess the hottest thing in management theory was management by wandering around, which is a little bit about what we're talking about. Getting out of the C-suite, getting down to the floor, getting down to the different operational parts and just talking to people and get a sense of the feeling of what's going on. And it was really interesting because he was telling me that, that it was a weird thing, you know, it's a chunk out of his schedule to do that. He understood it was positive for the organization and that he needed to go out and survey how his team was function and observe how his team and, and identify talent because they're out there. But sometimes you get into those circumstances where mid-level managers are kind of not noticing the talent that the lower level employees have or are misjudging it or sometimes are actively working it against it because they're fear of their job. But in this conversation he was saying, you know, this seems like the least important thing that I do. It's actually one of the most important, but I also have to not just get stuck in this. When you were telling the anecdote, Alex, about the restaurant, you know, most of the time, that's a big time sink to be able to manage this way and get to know people deeply. And if you've got a reasonably large organization, you can only do so much of it. So to me, it, it, what I took away as that lesson is that you have to really plan for it discipline it 
and figure out what your end goal is for doing this wandering around and talk to people because it can turn into the biggest time sink of all time because if you're a social person, you're just talking and talking and talking and you're not getting stuff done. I mean, I, I have to admit that I, I believe that most of a CEO's job, and I didn't do this very well when I was doing it, um, most of the CEO job is to walk around and talk to people, <laughs> like, you know, is to have conversations with people and not pretty much do anything. Um, and one of the mistakes that I made is it, for a long time was to try to do everything myself. Um, and I learned that I had to, you know, um, again, generally those highly technical people that I hired, the rule of thumb was they had to know more about what they were doing than I did. Like, you know, so I had to feel like I can go to them for advice, you know, to, to do those things. Um, and then the people that, that we hired that were starting were people who I felt like they're malleable, they're, they're a good start, they're focused, all those things. They have the basics of being a good all around employee. And then we'll figure out how to, um, skill, skill them up. Um, yeah, go ahead, CJ. I'm super careful about when when I'm hiring someone as a full timer. If I have a if I have a project or something that I'm trying to achieve that someone's a really good fit for, that's not a forever project. I got to make sure that I've got a vision for that person three years, five years. Every employee that you walk around and look at, you have to say, "What does that person look like in five years? Like, what's their trajectory where they're going?" Because if I don't have an answer to that question, I've disrespected that person because I don't know what I want them to do. And if I don't have a job for them and now they're looking for one, that's that's not a great way to be. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention was you've got to be really careful and, and cognizant when, you, when your team grows to a certain size that you're not overburdening your really good employees because you're not paying close enough attention to somebody who maybe is just getting by. And this is where all this talk about wanting to walk around and talk to people and get to know them and understand their day-to-day -day, uh, just by being present, just by being an, a little bit of an outsider walking in and observing the, a group of people who you don't necessarily talk to every single day can sometimes be what reveals that to you of like, okay, how do I need to influence this group dynamic so that we're all rowing the boat in the same direction at the, and that we're getting it done and that I don't have one person really strung out because they've just – aren't asking for help. They just decided, I'm just going to take all this on. Yeah. And, and I think that the, um, the interaction is really important. One of the things is really working on constantly improving someone's, uh, skill set too. So we really got into with pixel core. Um, we really got into a, uh, constantly trying to upgrade people, what people knew how to do. And the, the danger of course, is that they're going to go work somewhere else. Cause I couldn't compete. If I brought a team in, I couldn't compete with um, my corporate clients. If they really like that person, uh, they, they can offer them more money than I can. And so, um, and so I really had to make sure that it was a good work experience, but, and also, uh, but we would do relatively regular meetings where we were just talking about the tech and trying to cross pollinate and may, having people feel like they were learning a lot and having people feel like and there was this, I love the saying, there's a, there, there's a CFO that talks to the CEO and says, what if we train everybody and then they leave? And the CEO goes, what if we don't? And they stay. <laughs> you know, so, so they, you know, so you have to think about how do you build up that workforce so that it's able, so that you're able to, um, you, you want them to constantly get better. And the best, one of the best networks I have right now is all my former employees. You know, I have a lot of people that work at a lot of big companies now because they came in as, you know, pretty basic, um, you know, uh, folks, you know, that, that we brought up to speed and then they ended up working at large corporations doing video and, I have, a, I have a great network of people that are, that are part of that if, if you do it well. Um, next question. Rian Smith in Trinidad, West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago writes in, can we get a framework or document to put people through to identify their skills and sort of have them like tags and be searchable? I know lots of people and sometimes forget who I could link for what. Go ahead, John. Yeah, larger organizations will have these tools incorporated into their learning management platforms or talent management platforms where you can actually articulate which skills different employees have, including after completing a training, you can assign those skills to people. We use one called SAP Success Factors at my office, but it's so complicated, nobody uses it. So in my department of 250 people taking phone calls, we have about 50 different skills, 50 different phone lines that come in. And we have a single spreadsheet and we're pushing it to its limit. So I wouldn't recommend it for anything larger than what I'm doing. But each row is a person, 
And then the columns are the person's name, their contact information, their available hours. And then the other columns are each of the different skills. And we just put in each cell a 0, a 0.5, or a 1, meaning you're not skilled, you're learning this skill, or you're fully skilled. So we can, uh, and then we have conditional formatting that turns those into green, yellow, red stoplights. So at a glance, I can look down and see, oh, I've got Steve Smith. He is available to take calls on this particular phone line, and I can just go put him on that phone line. So a simple spreadsheet works really well for up to our size. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, and I'd say it's, uh, it's not just the skill that they have now. It's, you know, sort of towards what Alex was talking about. It's what are they curious about? Where do, where do they want to go? Uh, so a lot of times uh, we'll take somebody and put them into something uh, that they want to just see how this works. We we actually had a, uh, a finance admin uh, uh, that was just working in finance, and she was curious about the consulting piece. And so we put her on a couple of jobs with, with the proper amount of training. And now she's one of our absolute top consultants, and and the, uh, all the projects and customers love her. Um, but that wouldn't have happened if we didn't listen to what she was curious about. Yeah, go, Bill. I just have to comment on John's thing about SAP because I went through a whole system uh, when one of the larger companies I was working with tried to get their entire operation on SAP. I, Wall Street used to love that because it there's all sorts of metrics built into the system, but it, they had the same experience. It is so complex that I remember talking again, the same CEO I was talking about earlier, uh, we were chatting one day and he was telling me about the difficulty of deciding whether it was more valuable to do to use a tool that Wall Street was in favor of and go through the pain of trying to train everybody up on this very complicated and complex system that has grown for so many large companies. And I think that's one of those things that you really, it's almost like you're taking a shot at your people when you bring in something that not the people have chosen, but some outside consultant. And you have to just organize that and decide, can you do this to your crew? That's what I was hearing out of that meeting with the CEO. He's really well, struggling with that. Interface is a big deal. You know, like how you interface and what is, what's easy for the, the employees to do and what's not easy. And when you start asking them to do lots of busy work that isn't easy for them to do, um, it is, you know, like we would, we do these things. We have a th thing for this show. Um, it's called an RFI, which is, you know, so it's a, um, today, Gordon Lake is our RFI um, uh, documenter. That's room for improvement. It's writing down everything that didn't work in the show every day. Somebody, almost every day, somebody writes down everything that doesn't work in the show today in the back end. We used to do that for everybody in the um, uh, for in PixScore. We would do that for all of our productions, where everybody would get a little like a link to a Google Doc. We tell you, do not try to come up with a solution. Do not write anything else. Just top of your head, write down things that aren't working. the The sandwiches are. We didn't have enough coffee. The sandwiches are too cold. Um, we loaded in too long. the The table isn't long enough. Uh, we had an or up to. We had an issue with the audio. We had all these other things. Just write them down. As they come up, it does two things. One is it it very easily will let people flare. Like, oh my gosh, this is, you'd see some, you'd see our guys look at something and they look at something and they have this cross eyed look and you see them going on their phone and then they go back to what they were doing. So it let them just vent the thing that wasn't working, but it let us go back and see all the things and we were able to improve and the feeling that things were improving and we started improving a lot faster when we started doing that because. Um, you know, and but it was like, don't try to figure it out. I don't want you to be conscious to it during the show. I just wanted to get it out of your head and not have it be a thing, knowing that it will be dealt with later. And, you know, we didn't deal with everything every single time, but wow, did it get better fast. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Um, I, I'll, I'll end with this. Beware the junk science behind skills identification. Um, you, you learn a lot of weird stuff on the way to a psych degree, a lot of which is what masquerades as science that um, – Really yeah, isn't. I will admit that I will not take a personality test. Like, I just don't think that oh, it, I, I don't want to, I, I, I just won't take it. I just refuse it. And the reason mostly is, is that I'm like, I feel like I'm more complicated than that. You know, like, and I feel everyone's more complicated than that. And, and trying to, and the problem you get into is that you start relating to the construct instead of the reality of the person. And it's really easy to start, you know, you start paying attention to, oh, well, they're a nine or that, of course, that's what they would do. Now you've created this box that paints them in a certain box and they are, but they are not a nine. They are CJ, <laughs> you know, and, and CJ is undefinable. Like, you know, like, like it's not like an, and, and, and thinking of them as a six or a nine or whatever they want to call it. Um, you know, it is 
the thing is, is that you start relating to that box that, that you've that you've created for them instead of the person. And the thing is, is that person is way more complicated than than the boxes. And it, and people want to put people into little boxes, and it it oftentimes is not um uh not a, not it's not as efficient. You think it's efficient, but what you're actually doing is is you're not relating to that person anymore. Uh, let's jump into the next question. We're kind of, we're going to, we're not Roscoe gonna Jones in Madison, Indiana writes in, how do you change strategies between five fifty and 500 size workforces? Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, I'd say th- there's another dimension just beyond the size is uh, the trajectory. So if you're five and you're expecting to go to 50, then you have a different strategy than if you're five for the foreseeable future. Uh, so keep in mind, the trajectory of where you're going that I think matters even more than this actual size. Uh, I think uh, as we've talked, there's a lot of uh, tools and a lot of folks out there that will help you out as um, part-time CFO or, or HR. And so some of those can come in on a part-time basis. So that, that definitely helps. Um, and a lot of times, as we talked about earlier with a lot of other topics, um, Hiring somebody that's more of a good fit, more of a generalist that is looking to do beyond what you're currently expecting to hire them in will serve you well, because then as you grow, you can fill in around them. Um, so both of those, I think, work well as you're as you're growing. I do think that when you're in the smaller end, you're going, you're much more generalists. And as you get bigger, you're going to more specialists, you know, that are doing what they're doing because you need everybody to be able to, everybody has to be able to run the boat at five people. When you get to 50 people, it starts to specialize, you know, out. Like we had, I mean, I was talking to someone about, well, you know, carnets are hard. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't really think about it because we had someone who's only, not their only job, but one of their, they, they dealt with travel, but it was their job to do carnets <laughs> like that was and there were people who in the in the and they would tell them what to do and and so there was just that's all they did and it was a much simpler process because that that's what they that's what they understood and it became invisible to us um to make those things happen so when you start to get those specialties and, and that happens i think not really at 50 because i didn't get to 50 but really once we got to 2025 20, we started having people take on certain um specialities that allowed us to do it i will say that um, people hate to talk about this, but HR becomes more and more important as the numbers of people start to go up, like your HR department, how you manage people, the level of paperwork that is required is a is both a management, but also a defensive me- measure. It just as you get bigger, you need to like pay more attention to that um, generally. You should pay attention to it all the time. But as you get bigger, you really have to pay more attention and respect the fact that there's just a lot of, you, you know, good fences make good neighbors and sometimes good employees and employer relationships. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, and it's important to caveat that just like when we talk about technical answers and the answers often, it depends. Same is true when we're talking about humans and planning. And so one thing to consider is when you're talking about five people, typically they are more generalist and they are also more utilized. So you're putting people in the different roles more often. They're spending more of their day busier. And if you have any sort of shrinkage or people not being able to work that were planned to work, it's a much bigger impact to your department. If you have one person call out on a five person team, that's 20 percent of your workforce. And that's a huge impact compared to one person calling out on 500 uh, person team because you can just quickly absorb that. So um, when we get to the numbers of hundreds or 500s, that's where that forecasting piece becomes a much, much bigger part of the overall work to make sure you're utilizing your resources throughout the year based off of seasonal trends, uh, whether it's staffing, shrinkage, um, or incoming work. You know, and one thing that we you do have to figure out is um, as it gets larger, we would definitely, as we were getting bigger, we definitely worked a lot on cross-pollinization. So how do we get people to do things that they're not, you know, that they've been around, but they don't necessarily know as well? So getting our <clears throat> our camera people to do TD makes them a better TD and a better camera operator. You know, so, so having them be a TD uh, helped us. Having them slowly learn how to be an A2 and then become an A1 means that they know all of those things. And, and when they know all of those things, they become an EIC, you know, so, so an, an engineer in charge because they know how to do all the little things and how they all work. And so, and, and they might be, an, uh, oftentimes we would define an EIC. There might be a, a team of four or five people going out to an event one of them is an EIC because they know how to run. They could set up all the different piece, parts of the gear and make those all, all work. And so those are things that, that you know, that cross-pollination and constantly training. I mean, the one thing that we definitely 
focused on a lot of, at Pixel Core was getting people to know every aspect of what we were doing. And again, we would sit down at lunches and sit down and other things where we would just answer questions. The technical guys would sit up in front, much like this, except there weren't so many of us and we were all in the same room, but we would sit around and just answer questions about why are we doing it this way and what does this do and everything else. And re-injecting that information back into the group um, was super valuable. Um, yeah, go ahead, CJ. I really love this question, I think, uh, because it, it's it's almost the perfect size. Is that five people, everybody's in the same room, and my main focus is how do I make sure that the people that are in the room are smarter than I am? I'm hiring people who are strong where I'm not strong, uh, and that's going to help us propel forward. By the time you you raise that factor of 10 to 50, now I've all of the rules are are explicit instead of implicit. Everybody's not in the same room, so I have to focus a little bit more on procedure, a little bit more on structure, uh, just because when everybody's in the same room, you don't have to have a procedure so that manu the manufacturing floor knows when the trucks are loading because they just overheard it by accident. Now there's got to be much more intentional communication. At 500, now all of a sudden you've got to be much more focused on procedure, much more focused on those HR departments and uh, make and and payroll and every just making sure that all of those things are rock solid so that you're not thinking about it because you don't have the time. Um, and but also you've got to remember if you've got if you're supporting a payroll of 500 people, that means that you've got some serious assets and some serious revenue, which means that you've got some not I don't want to say a target on your back, but there's more to lose. So you've got to be really, really careful about protecting yourself and making sure that uh, that your leadership of your business is focused on making sure that the mission and the culture of the business is clear. Um, and, but you also have to make sure that there's somebody else who's minding you know, all of the, all of the paperwork to make sure that you're not, you know, going off into some area where liabilities are concerned. I think as a, as a company grows too, for a founder, especially and me being a founder for the last company I had for 20 years, um, empathy is a really, really important skill. Um, and it's something that you can lose over time. You started with a handful of people that were all your peers and now you have a huge, you know, a growing number of people. And it's really sometimes hard to hear the little things that they're complaining about. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, like you don't know how to make payroll next week. And they're talking about, I don't know, the, the you know, the toilet paper, you know, in the, in the bathroom. And you're just like, oh, uh, you know, like, like, you know, just, you know, and, and you realize that, but it's really important to get past that. It's really important to hear what they're upset about, figure out ways that like, well, how do we solve that? Like, how do we make that, how do we make that go away? Um, you know, because it's, it's, you, you can get caught up in the bigger problems of a company, um, pretty quickly and, and, um, and, and you're thinking about those things and everybody else's concerns feel very small for you, but they're not for them. <laughs> you know, and so, so you have to, you know, and, and, and it's the, you know, having people going different directions and being frustrated is super inefficient for a company, you know, so having people feel like you can't take care of everything. So sometimes just explaining what you can't do and why you can't do it, but, but it is something that you just have to really get that that's, you know, when people feel valued, they do so much more work that it's worth the time to figure it out if you can. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. So it's interesting when you're running a company that's five people, you tend to have to be, you tend to get distracted a lot because as you're potentially calling in numbers for payroll or running payroll yourself, somebody might be outside yelling that the copier doesn't work. So now you get distracted and you have to go find out how are we going to fix the copier? Do we do it ourselves? Do we call in the repairman? So it becomes very complicated at a small level. But the same, there's still those challenges when you're 500 people because now the broken copier has become the board meeting that's coming up. And now you have to do all these presentations for the board meeting. And so it's just a matter of scale and the problems are always as difficult. They're just changed by your perspective and where you are. Good, Bill. Yeah, also, you know, you talk about you want everybody in the organization to be smarter, at least at what they do, than you are. But then you also get into the trouble of all businesses are pyramids. And if there are five people and three of them think they can run things, there's a certain conflict with that, too. And as you get out, it seemed to me that as the businesses got bigger that I was involved with, uh, People stopped looking for people who could be everything to everyone, and they were really looking for someone often that could fill a role that was important for the business and sustain that without being feeling constrained 
over months, years, maybe even decades, find somebody who fit in and was solid for the organization and didn't want to get to always to the next level. Because if you have 20 of those people at that level of the organization in different divisions and they all want to get to the top, eventually they're most of them are going to be very unsatisfied and may try to yeah, look we elsewhere didn't. for that. We definitely didn't try to make everyone like like it was, you know, at the beginning. And and again, it was five people. Not all of us could do the same thing. We all, mm -hmm. it was, you know, we would all have, you know, we'd have a really good audio person, a really good this person, a really good that person, a really good technical person. Um, but we all saw saw each other as peers. As it, as it grew up, we'd have, again, the ratio for me was about one to one to three. So one to three or four people. I'd have one that is a, a superstar that I'm paying more money to. And then I'd have three or four around them that I'm paying, you know, a much less, you know, oftentimes half <laughs> you know, what they're getting paid um, uh, or less um, that are learning how to do that from them. Um, but it, the goal was always to let the people, and here's the interesting thing. It's not having them do nothing because they got into this, as Bill talked about earlier, they got into this because they love doing things. So you let, the goal was is to let the, the technical people do what they love to do um, but give them the support to not do the things they don't want to do. Like, and, and if you're getting started, we're going to give you a bunch of things that they don't want to do, but you're learning. You have to figure out how to do those things. So if they don't want to do that part, we hand it off to other people to, to make that happen. And as we got larger, we could have people that that's their only job. Like we had some people that just were never going to be like, we're talking about production right now in live production. There are people who are not built for live. Like there is a, there is a, uh, a framework of people who are good at live. Like I have, I, I personally happen to have a weird um, emotional reaction to stress, which is that I will go numb, like immediately. Like if something goes, if something becomes really, um, if I get into a high stress, I got into a high stress moment when I got married and everyone thought I didn't care because I just was like, I, I had this one moment where I couldn't get the, I was out like an hour before and I couldn't find a printer for the little things we hand out when you walk in. I don't know why I was doing that, but I was, and I couldn't find it and I got really upset and then boom, it turned off and then I was off for the rest of the day, you know, and I can't feel anything. Like I can't, there is zero, there is zero emotion for me when I get into stress. Now it turns out not a great thing to do when you're at your own wedding very good thing if you're doing live. <laughs> so, so things can, a lot of things can go wrong and I can immediately just switch into this. I don't, I don't do it on purpose. I don't go, okay, now I'm not feeling anything. I just stop feeling things. And then I start responding to what, what is actually happening. And I start working on those things. Um, so, but there are a lot of people that that doesn't happen for. And I had to learn over time not to put them in that position because I had I had one TD that just stood up and walked out like in the middle of my show. <laughs> I had to sit down and cut the rest of the show because they just couldn't take the pressure. There was so many things happening at one time. There's a lot of things going wrong. And so the other thing is, is to look at making sure you're not putting people. We had a I had a producer who was an amazing employee who would get panic attacks when they produced live events. Instead of, and I, and I should have fixed it faster, but, you know, they would literally have to pull over from the side of the road, you know, because they were, they were having these panic attacks. And, um, and, and so the thing is, is that you have to find where people are good at it and where that makes sense and let them be that thing um, and find out how do you pull the best out of what they have to offer, not how do you make them someone that they're not. And so we would have people in the warehouse that were never going to be in production, but they were really good at sorting things and putting things in. They like put their headphones on and take the kit that came back in and put it all away and everything else. And that was great. <laughs> like they were, and they were, and, and they didn't need to do more than that. Um, and you need people like that as well to what Bill's saying. You need people who just want to do the thing as opposed to some people who want to take over the world. You want, you need a couple of take over the worlds, but not very many. Like the take over the world, that's like one or two other people in the company. <laughs> like otherwise they, they split the beehive. Um, anyway, so go ahead, Craig. Yeah. Just a quick point on, you know, as we're talking about uh, growing, I think there is a particular burden. Obviously, in leader, you need to be able to make a decision about things like the upcoming payroll and all those sort of things. Uh, but as you grow, especially with employees, there's a lot more people with things at stake, uh, you know, for the success of the company. And so, uh, as Bill talked about, uh, walking around um, and listening to people, especially where they have a lot more interaction with end customers than you do hearing them and, and keeping that feedback open uh, so that it's not just leaders off in some separate uh, tower <laughs> uh, making decisions for the company. Uh, opening up to, to people that have a lot more at stake uh, can really help. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, Jason. 
I'll reiterate this really quickly. If you've been successful in business, you might think, oh, well, oh I'm good at empathy. I mean, I'm, I'm an open book. I'm easy to listen to. You know, I listen to people. Of course I do. You don't know what empathy is. Everybody can be stretched in this regard and like, you know, slow down and recognize it. it's a really important lesson. And there's a lot of CEOs that aren't good at it. <laughs> it's just, you know, like I work, I've, my, my job for the last year and a half of Pixel Core was only heads of state and, and CEOs. And I can tell you a lot of them are, are not, that that's not their strong suit. They're good at managing. They're good at me in meetings. They like to be completely separated. But the ones that are able to get out there and talk to people and be part of that conversation, um, you know, they just have a better employee culture, in my opinion. Uh, next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama, PA writes in, how do you get to a place where you can afford hired staff? I usually end up doing everything myself since they are not able to solve the problems at the same speed or level as me, even though they are trained. Any techniques or methods to hire right? Go ahead, Mark. I think you just have to accept the fact that very many times you're not going to find people to do things as fast as you. But in order to grow, you have to let, you just have to hold your breath and let them do the work at their pace while you go out and get more work. And then that enables you to grow the team and find people that can do things faster than you. There you go, CJ. I always look for what we call uh, the intangibles, right? I can teach somebody about my business, but I can't teach someone to to have manners and to show up on time and to treat others with respect. Like those things, the things that you can't teach is what I'm most interested in when I'm interviewing someone. Richard Branson was very, is, is very well known for hiring. I think he hired a waitress one time, like just a good, really good waitress. He didn't know what to do with her. <laughs> he just knew that she was a good person that was going to be valuable in a company and she didn't belong here, you know? And, and so, um, I think that you're right that being, a, you know, when you see someone that's really good, um, you know, for me, a lot of what I do have, and, what, and what I've done for 20 years now is I figure out projects that are, we're all going to get together, you know, in between the paid gigs, doing things. You get to see who really cares because they show up. Um, I mean, you see we have a big, big staff putting these things together. You're getting to see who cares about this stuff and just wants to do it because they're doing it. You, um, you get to see, you get to cross pollinate, you get to fail. You know, like that's the big thing is, is you have a, you have space to fail. So I do a lot of test projects and, and spec projects on my own. Um, if I'm getting paid, everyone's getting paid. But if the, if, if we're doing stuff, I do a lot of things where we've done this here, where we've done, Hey, we're doing a soccer game or, Hey, we're covering a, uh, you know, an AI event or whatever. And we, and we're going to do more of that next year. Um, the, the coverage of the conventions, it's all figuring out, like it's us learning together. It's us figuring out things together. And we're in a place where if it doesn't work out perfectly, it's okay. You know, like when I do for most of my clients, I can't afford that. Like I hire people who have probably most of the, most of the teams that I hire are, you know, 10, 20 years for every single person is on that. But I need, but how am I going to get the next generation of that? And that's when I'm doing all these test projects. So when we're covering, you know, covering other things and, and when we're doing these volunteer projects, a lot of it's me figuring out. And, and finding an opportunity for me to learn, but also for other people to learn. Not even just figuring out who to hire, but like we're all learning together. And we're all getting better because of that, because we're pressing up against it. Um, next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana writes in, how do mentors fit into your workforce management goals? Go ahead, Mark. So we've covered a lot of this, but I think what happens as a company grows is the CEO or the leader has to be out there and be the face of the company to bring in more business and to build those relationships and networking. The next layer down, whether it's the C-suite or project managers, they really have to be some people that are, have great people skills, that have a great attitude, and really are passionate about what they do. That then spreads down to the layer underneath them, which enables them to become mentors so that they're looking for the talent to grow the company that will move up into that management position. And at the same time, they're educating them on, you know, the newer people coming up, whether that whether you've gotten them from contracts or whether you've brought them in and you're just bringing them up through organic ways, it helps them grow into that position. And it and so the mentoring is a huge impact. Go, John. We use a mentor program at our office to bridge the gap between the formal training and the on the job work. So we use we take our high performers, we develop their soft skills and their training skills as well as some of their leadership skills, which helps us have some of that talent pipeline we've talked about previously. And after the person goes through the classroom training with my team, we hand them off to a mentor to teach them and side by side at the job to really give provide that expertise and feedback so the person feels welcome to the team as well as they can develop their skills in the flow of work. 
And oftentimes, again, what I do a lot is surround one technical person with some folks that are less technical than they are and have them all working together. And, you know, a lot of times that the, the for me, the best thing to do is just have them all doing something where that has to be done. And sometimes those are test systems, those are test processes. Um, you know, the Final Cut user group, that virtual user group used to be a big test process. And sometimes it would come out very badly um, because we were training crew when we were doing that. Um, next question. Uh, Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York writes in, what are some of the best practices you do to help with team morale so that the best product possible can be produced and everyone is proud of the team they are working on? Good, Craig. I'd say one of the biggest things is ownership. Uh, if somebody's doing a job and you've told them exactly how to do every single piece of their job, it's not as rewarding. And if, but if you give them a lot more flexibility, uh, given that they have the skills to do it, uh, they're going to take a lot more pride of that. And especially if they're working with a team that they need, they can collaborate with others. That is a massive impact on, on their happiness and fulfillment and the quality of the product actually. Yeah. It, it's, I used to think that I had to tell everybody everything, <laughs> but I've learned that oftentimes they're focused on that thing. And, and I ask, well, how should we do this? How do you, how do you recommend, especially if you're, high, if you're a highly technical person, I don't explicitly tell, I tell them what I'm trying to get done. I don't tell them how to do that thing. I just want to know how they would do it. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I go, or I would let them do it. And I go, well, that's not working. Let's do it this way or whatever. But for the most part, I try to have people around me um, coming up with the solution. Yeah, go CJ. Most companies have an outward facing mission statement. I'm a firm believer in, we should have in inward facing clearly stated core values. And when your business has things that you will not compromise on in terms of product quality, in terms of how you treat each other, in terms of focusing on whether it's focusing on positivity or bringing solutions, defining those core values and embodying them in your day-to-day -day business and everything that you do sets an example for everyone else. But the only way that it, the only way that you really have success with it is if you also hold people accountable, right? When there is, when people stray away from that, you've got to call them on it. And it's not a person, it's nothing personal. It's not in a mean way. It's just, hey, this is not, uh, this is not in lockstep with what we believe in or challenge them and say, and there is a way to do this tactfully where you say, hey, Maybe there was a better way to go about this that's more in line with, you know, how we do. And then when you train people how to think and how to approach a problem, then all of a sudden you don't have to be there to make every decision, right? They know the guidelines that's going to help them uh, have their, their truth. When you uh, load into the Ritz, I've talked about this before in the show, but when you load into the Ritz in the back, um, you go through the, the um, it's, it, there's a plaque that every Ritz has that says, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And it's how you operate, how you hold yourself, and how you interact with everyone around you. And they take it really seriously. And if you go to Rich, you'll notice it. You'll feel it. You know, like, because it's something that's it's like a mantra there. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Way back in the 1900s, when I went to business school, we studied something called quality circles. And quality circles are when you sit down with the people in the trenches and you learn from them how to improve your business that helps them feel like part of the solution to improving the business. And it goes a long way towards morale. Yeah, absolutely. A good panel. I wasn't sure. Like we started off the first couple minutes. I always say this, but we started off the couple minutes and I was like, this is going to last like 10 minutes. And then uh, here we are right at the very end. So anyway, um, it is uh, uh, really, really great. It was a really great panel. Thanks to everyone with that have been dealing with this and uh, here to talk about it. I really appreciate the time. Uh, that you put in to share with everybody else. And thanks to the producers for all the great questions, both in the first hour and the second hour. We had a lot of lot of great questions. Um, remember that you can ask them any time of the day at askofficehours.global. Um, and uh, thanks uh, to the incredible team that, that makes this happen, uh, that is cutting the show, that is managing the RFIs, that is liaison with the, with, with the, uh, the panel, um, managing the questions, uh, you know, doing all the things that are necessary, developing the software that we do here, building the management, figuring out what we're going to do every day. All of those things are really, really valuable. So thank you so much for all of your time. Um, uh, we traveled 41,000 miles today, 67,000 kilometers, and that is 331 million bananas for scale. Uh, let's go ahead to after hours. Keep on forgetting to find my banana. It's right here. I had to unwrap my banana for scale. They come in six packs and I didn't have time. Uh, mine was Christmas nearby. I have mine. Mine are still in the mailbox. Oh, here it is. I tag nab it. 
Here's the thing. I put it away because when Michael when Michael Krasny comes, I don't want to explain what the banana is. You so I want to look serious. I, like, I, I don't want him to look at me and go, "What, what is the banana?" <laughs> it's, it's weird. To have it sitting on your I thought desk you were all the serious, time. Lindsay. I thought, yeah, I thought I thought you I thought you were a good technical person, but you have a plastic banana on your desk. <laughs> And so that's um. That's Sir, why. it's the conference line. And then Monday, I can't find it because I'm like, it's it was Friday, and then I didn't think about it, and there we go. That's how these things happen. All right. So you have to put a label on it. <laughs> exactly. The nail for scale. Not for technical use. But that won't make it any weirder at all. <laughs> <laughs> this is the serious banana. Business banana. Business banana. Thanks, everybody. This was fun. Have a great day.